happy Earth Day to you as well. It's very uh, important day that we're having here, Song Symposium and Earth Day, we're coming together. And we are about one after, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started with this wonderful event. First, I'm Dr. Lee Frame. I will be your host today. Um, so you're gonna hear a lot from me. <laughs> and I thought you might wanna know a little bit about me. Um, so I lead the GW Integrative Medicine Programs and the Office of Integrative Medicine and Health, as well as the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center, but we'll have more on this new center to come um, from the center's uh, medical director, Dr. Lorenzo Norris, later in this event. Uh, but first, a brief introduction to the GW Office of Integrative Medicine and Health, or OIMH for short, and its annual event, the Sung Symposium. In 2017, Dr. Pan founded OIMH in the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership under the auspices of then and current chair, Leslie Davidson, who I have to add has been extremely supportive and thank you very much, Dr. Davidson. Uh, Dr. Pan also founded the GW Center for Integrative Medicine in 1998. So integrative medicine has been part of GW for decades. The OIMH mission is to ensure excellence and sustainability of integrative medicine through commitments to high quality education and training, community engagement, strategic partnerships, evidence-based practice, and patient-centered care. OIMH leads professional development, education, scholarly activities, and community outreach in integrative health approaches. OIMH was started with a generous donation by GW alumnus, Dr. Patrick Sung and his wife, Marguerite. Dr. Sun was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, and the integrative medicine approaches he adopted have put him in remission. So Dr. Sung actually understands the power of an integrative approach to medicine firsthand, and he was generous with his donation to allow us to spread the word about the evidence behind this to others. Today, the work of OMH is made possible by generous donations from those touched by integrative medicine around the globe. We hope you too will consider supporting our work, such as this annual event, our Sung Symposium. This event was named the Sung Symposium in honor of the generosity of the Sungs and was first held in 2018. The Sung Symposium promotes the use of integrative medicine and has had several themes, including brain health, longevity, whole health, and now resiliency and well being. To kick off this year's Sung Symposium, we are fortunate to have Dr. Barbara Bass, Vice President for Health Affairs, Dean of the GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and Chief Executive Officer of the GW Medical Faculty Associates. Thank you for joining us, Dean Bass. We eagerly await your opening remarks. Oh, oh thank you so much, Dr. Frame. This, is a, this annual event is really a, a highlight of our academic year, you know, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to be here. And we've come a long way in our technology, too. I remember the first year, it was like, oh, my gosh, I mean, we're going to do this, you know, but, and I hope that soon we'll be able to, although this virtual format works quite well, I hope that we'll also be able to join together uh, in one place, because um, there's great value in that as well, particularly when we think about whole person, whole, whole person uh, presence, health, and everything else. But thank you for having me. And, and I got to say, it's, um, it's, I want to particularly, like you, thank the Sung family for having uh, prov provided that valuable investment that helped launch this program and helps to sustain it still. Um, that kind of generosity really as you can see from things like this, really makes a huge difference um, and can really propel, uh, you know, a, a, a well-deserved uh, new initiative forward in a way that, uh, you know, sometimes it needs that extra, that extra investment. So thank you so much to the Sun family for that. And also thank you to Dr. Pan for his, you know, visionary, um, visionary adoption of this concept of whole person health and um, many, many years ago. Um, and I, I guess as I was uh, looking over some of the, uh, you know, some of the programs you've had, I mean, it really is wonderful that this program, this Office of Integrated Medicine, really both educates um, providers and the public uh, outreach. Um, it does um, meaningful research in terms of how best to uh, advance and utilize whole health principles and integrative medicine concepts. Um, and it, it also, of course, um, uh, provides uh, information to our public and 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 great awareness of the value that uh, this approach to medicine, uh, to health, I'm gonna to say to health, not to medicine, but to health uh, can make. Um, and I, as I reflect on this, these last couple of years, you know, one of the things we always say is never let a good disaster, or never, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think in some respects, the incredible stress that uh, everyone has felt during this last time uh, this last two hard years, which are not quite over yet. I hate to say it, they're not over yet. Um, 
has really kind of over and over again demonstrated to all of us as providers, as educators, as leaders, as people uh, living their lives that um, that we can't just be fixed by medicine. You know, we really need a different set of tools to keep us healthy and well during these special times. And I would say that may be one area of awareness uh, of, the, of the important important uh, role that these principles of integrative medicine um, have been amplified during this time. And so let's don't let that, that oh, heightened awareness right now slip away. I mean, let's use this as a moment to really embrace these concept, concepts and bring them forward because I think we've all seen clearly enough that just plain old medicine is not gonna keep us well during these last, uh, these last two years. So congrats to those of you who have really been on the leadership forefront of um, advancing this principle of care and the uh, evidence and research and education around it. I'm really, really excited to see that. Um, and then to see this time actually, you know, another, another point where we don't let a tremendous disaster go to waste was the formation of our Resilience and Wellness Center at uh, GW School of Medicine and Health Science, which serves our entire academic health enterprise. And boy, do we have fantastic leadership in that group with you, Dr. Frame and Dr. Norris and the team that's been built in there. Uh, I think you're going to see the, uh, and the, you know, again, sort of the synergistic um, uh, opportunities that bringing these two programs together, but, you know, really has um, empowered uh, people to look carefully at their own health, to be, have greater awareness of their own uh, vulnerabilities and the need to develop strategies and, and pathways to resilience uh, and good health. So kudos to everyone that's um, part of these programs that are, uh, have been launched and expanded and further developed over um, many years and especially these last couple of hard years. So good luck today in this symposium. I'm sure it's gonna be fabulous. Uh, it's, a, it's always great. To, I'm, I'm so glad that you do this in the springtime as well. It's a time when we all wanna have some uh, resuscitation and rebirth and uh, couldn't be a better day for it here in Washington, DC and better time of the year for everyone, I hope. So thank you very much, Dr. Frame. And thank you for our visiting uh, speakers as well, who I know will really uh, provide uh, great, great insights for the learners that we have gathered with us today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and for those words. Uh, one thing that really stood out to me is the you hit on the word that really speaks to me of empowerment. We're, we're trying to empower people with knowledge and data and research and a better understanding. So uh, I'm glad that that comes through. Um, so we will continue on that path of empowerment. And I think everyone is gonna feel very empowered after this next speaker. Um, I'm extremely pleased and frankly honored to welcome one of my close colleagues in the field of integrative medicine, Dr. Francois was Adnan. Uh, she's a, in our field, she actually needs no introduction. She's extremely well known in the field. Um, but just to give you a brief introduction, uh, Francoise is the Chief Whole Health and Wellbeing Officer at University Hospitals Health System in Cleveland, the Director of Connor Whole Health, and the Chair of the Board of Directors at the Academic Consortium of Integrative Medicine and Health. I could go on and on about her accomplishments, but Francoise has asked me to keep this brief and give her the extra time to engage us. We are in for a treat. So without further delay, I turn it over to you, Francoise. Thank you so much, uh, Lee. And thank you kindly for those words, but uh, more important for the uh, invitations. And Thank you to uh, GW, Office of Integrative Medicine and Health, and of course the GW Residence, uh, Res uh, Resilience and Wellbeing Center for inviting me. So it's a great pleasure. I decided I have no slide actually for you. I'm going to go wild um, and uh, do something a little bit different. Um, no need for slide, just having a uh, a presentation for you that uh, I hope would be uh, meaningful and impactful. I know that we'll have um, Q and A questions at the end of um, the three speakers, the two esteemed speakers uh, after me. But um, I think that using the chat to just say hello to old friends, new friends, and colleagues is really fun. So keep it going, and you know it makes us feel like we are. 
uh, together in the same room and uh, as much connected as, um, as we love to be. So um, I like to start my presentation with a short meditation. And you know, all of us probably run from a busy morning uh, and are now decided to be here with each other. And why don't we take a moment to anchor ourselves into the present and to feel our connection. So I'm inviting you to uh, find a comfortable position. You can use the back of the chair to support you. You can stand up, you can sit straight. Just make sure that you're not distracted by discomfort. And start to pay attention to your breath as it goes in and out your nose. Maybe gently close your eyes, or if you prefer, you can simply look down. And we do that just to decrease distraction and, and stimuli. And pay attention to your breath really means nothing else than being present, being an observer. You don't need to change anything. You don't need to change the rhythm, the depth, the cadence of the breath. Just breathe in and out your nose. And then using your imagination, see if you can visualize an image of peace into your mind's eyes. Maybe it's the word peace. Maybe it's a symbol. Maybe it's a place that you like or the face of someone you love. And then repeat silently this simple affirmation as you are breathing in, I am breathing out peaceful and present. And let's imagine, let's actually breathe together. Breathing in, I am breathing out peaceful and present. One last time, breathing in, I am breathing out peaceful and present. Take a moment to notice how you feel. And when you are ready, open your eyes. Great, so my topic today is about thriving through uncertainty. Lesson learned from people who are resilient. And we all know we learn a lot over the last two years um, of each other, of ourselves, of our community, of what works, of what doesn't work. And I'm trying to, uh, going to put it together for you. Today, I will share some practical tools to build and increase your resilience. I hope to leave you some, with some hope, but I will also challenge you with a call for action. We teach best what we need to learn. And there is no coincidence that I'm here with you today to talk about this topic. Fighting my own battles, surviving my own challenges, finding my grit, using pain and fear and discomfort to find an opportunity. Here I am. I have been a psychiatrist for uh, 25 years about, and it down, I mean, as I was calculating, I realized that I have been for about 35,000 hours one-on-one -on -one with patients. Incredible. And I saw that people get beaten, um, betrayed, if you lost, guilty, angry, sad, scared, desperate, resentful obvious, heartbroken, shocked, overwhelmed. 
but somehow they survive. Somehow they emerge, they stand back up and move forward and even thrive. I have heard it all and I'm still amazed. My patients have shown me over and over about how resilient human are. So many times I've been at Ao, and I'm so grateful for the lesson I have learned from each and every one of them. As long as I remember, resilience has always been fascinating to me, almost bewilderment before I even knew what the word meant. Hearing stories after stories of struggle and victories, witnessing tears and triumphs, I've spent really frankly my life wondering how do people do it? How do they thrive? How do we do it? How do you do it? How do I do it? And I've been wondering, is resilience a trait of the superwoman or the superman? Well, let me tell you, I really don't know much for sure. But one thing that I know is the simple truth, no. After 35,000 hours spent listening, guiding patients, I learned three things. And all of them give me hope. First, resilience in my mind is the ultimate equalizer. What I mean by that? means that resilience is not related to how much you have, what would you vote for, what is your title. Sure, it might obviously uh, help, but I have seen too often people who have everything. And for some reason, at some point, they can't cope. Whatever Step, step they need to take is just too much. And I've seen the opposite. People who have nothing, people who have such difficult circumstances that you can barely imagine how do they do it, but somehow they find joy, purpose, meaning, and can take the, the, second, the next step. I also feel that resilience is categorically refusing to be a victim. It's a choice. It's an action word. It's a choice we make not to blame, but to face what is, because it, at the end of the day, it is up to us to find the way back up. But the best of all is that resilience is a skill. It's a practice, it's a discipline. Nobody is born with it and it can be learned. So I hope today I'll give you some guidance and some practical steps on how to build it. How do we put it all together? The first thing, and I know I'm talking uh, to some, uh, some people who really believe that uh, as well. But often it's not be because we are advising others to do this that we are good at doing that ourselves. So I feel like self care is the first step with resilience. It really, resilience is, is the, the foundation, is self care. The most important word in self care is self. Remember when uh, we, we used to fly, then we are back to a certain degree in, in flying. The, the flight attendant always requests and remind us that we need to put the oxygen mask on us first before we attend someone in need. They do that for 
an analogy. Uh, and they do that for a reason. Many of us are not so good at it. And we treat our, our children or family or work or car or dog better than we treat ourselves. But it really is not negotiable. If we want to bring the best version of ourselves into the world, we really need to take care of ourselves. Because every, everything is just going to be harder when we are going to when we are depleted. So self-care is, is a bad reputation, but it's just the opposite of being selfish. Because if I take care of myself, I'm going to bring out the best version of myself. So I'm a physician and I start my career actually as a family medicine physician. Uh, when I was, you know, taking pulse and blood pressure and all those vitals. And of course, we do not have um, a cuff that we can put on, around our arm to measure our resilience level or, or, or stress level. So there is um, a little self-assessment <clears throat> that I'd like to take you through and um, uh, do this with me. So the, and you know, by the way, feel free to use the chat to, uh, to answer some of those questions and uh, keep it alive. I'm, uh, we, all, we are among friends and colleagues. First questions I'd like you to ask yourself is this. When you are at your best, when you are in your zone, when things seem easy, how do you feel? How do you behave? What are you like? It could be physically, it could be emotionally, it could be cognitively, spiritually. Uh, I know that for me, this um, when I'm at my best, when I feel like I'm, I'm in the flow, in the zone, I have a great sense of humor and it's easy for me to make a decision. Ask yourself the opposite question. When you feel like you cannot take the next step, when you are at your worst, when stress is really to taking the best out of you, how do you feel? How do you behave? What are you like? Again, could be physical, could be physically, could be emotionally, spiritually, cognitively. How do you know you're not doing well? For me, when uh, I am at my worst, basically, I am someone I don't like, basically. I am judgmental. I'm critical, I'm cynical, I feel like everybody is so slow, and I take things personally, too sensitive. In short, I really don't like that person, and certainly I'm not, I'm not effective. Yeah, Lee, you get short temper. Me too, and uh, that's clearly not effective, and, and certainly uh, not the best version of myself. Awareness is key. Awareness is really, you know, the, the, the pillar of uh, emotional intelligence. And without awareness, it's really hard to make changes in ourself. So, you know, two questions, right? Starting with, how are you at your best? How are you at your worst? Two more questions. What do you know, what do you know for sure that is always helping you, always give you a little lift. Very personal. And by now, you probably know 
that, you know, what is your, your best antidote to feel stressed? For me, taking a walk and listening to my, you know, some upbeat music. Same questions, but what do you know that always, if you do X, is going to make you feel worse? Yeah, good, uh, good answer. Thank you for, for being uh, partic participating in this. So what do you know that always making, making you feel worse? For me, not getting enough sleep is, um, is, is definitely a recipe for disaster. So why is this important? Because this is kind of your feedback loop. You, you know, if you see self-care is always important, but if you are at your worst, it's basically an emergency and you need to even emphasize even more. Now, you, maybe you have noticed that a lot of us, when we are at our worst, we just do more of what's not helpful to us. This week has been really hectic for me. I was kind of falling short in uh, preparing for this presentation. And yesterday, it would have been so easy to say, you know what, I'm just going to pull, uh, not the all night, but working late. And uh, guess what? Then today, I would have arrived exhausted, probably lost my train of thoughts, and completely missing this really, frankly, fantastic opportunity I have to connect with you. So because I'm aware, I use more of what's helpful to me. I went on a walk, I literally dragged myself out of my office, went on a walk, got to bed early, listened this morning to some upbeat music. And somehow, you know, I know that I'm talking about something that I'm uh, I love, and I know I could, uh, I could pull it through without spending a few more hours preparing. So um, again, I can't say enough about the importance to be self-aware and uh, um, as, as it it's a required step to manage our stress and, and as we build our resilience. So um, when I talk about self-care here, I'm talking really about the basics. I'm talking about healthy nutrition. Uh, and to keep it really, really simple, and uh, Lee, you can, you can add, but I said, okay, eat more veggies, more fruits, less sugar. Keep it really, really simple here. Um, stay hydrated. You know, that the first sign of uh, fatigue is, uh, of the first sign of dehydration is fatigue. Move your body, uh, choose something that you like because every single step counts. Don't put, you know, unreasonable goal that you're not going to fall, your, fall through and give you a reason to beat yourself up. Just take some small goals, but honor and treat yourself like you are really precious and get enough sleep. It says that 70% of Americans are sleep deprived. I mean, it's crazy and you know i don't know about you but for me one night of poor sleep is enough to uh, to really derail me and um uh, it required a lot of discipline and um to 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 be respectful of that so and then uh we you know we talk about food nutrition uh hydration movement uh, sleep, and the last is, of course, find tools to manage your stress. And that tool, you know, it's yours. We I ask you, but you know, it's always helping you. So uh, that's one of your tools. But I wanted to comment on two, um, two other tools, mindfulness and gratitude. Do you know, by the way, that uh, American Medical Association said that more than 80% of visits to primary care are due to conditions that are either caused or exacerbated by stress. 
Mark Twain, by the way, I mean, you might, you, you probably know that quote. He said, I have had a lot of worries in my life, most of which never happen. Right? I think we can all relate to that. What a waste of energy. We are literally hijacked by a train of thoughts. We are telling ourselves stories. And then we look for evidence to confirm them. And we, can, we become so convinced that the worst is going to happen. One of the antidote to being hijacked by a train of thoughts is mindfulness. It's the, the practice the skill to stay present as an observer. We are not in the past, what we could have done, should have done, would have done, but often leads to regrets and, and sorrow. And we're not jumping into the future, the to-do list, what's going, what might happen, which most of it never does. Uh, the to-do list, but that often leads to worries and anxiety. My favorite quote is from Eleanor Roosevelt. She said, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. And that's what we call it, the present. Let's take a moment right now to anchor ourselves in the present. I like to use our senses to do that. What you see, what you feel, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste. Look at something like you have never seen it before. Be here, right now. Not an easy thing to do, to be present, to be mindful. I know that uh, the next speakers are going to talk about research and more uh, in depth with, about mindfulness, but I uh, feel like it's such an important tool, a way of living, really, that I wanted to mention here. It's giving us an option to jump off the train of thoughts, to take an inventory of the moment, to be aware, again, not only of what's going on with us, but what's going on in our surrounding. And often it makes this stress that big as this, like this, because this is not manageable, but it was compiled with storytelling. This is, is manageable. And it's certainly uh, not a way to, not to address what's going on, but to address it with the facts and objectively, not with the storytelling that we are so good to tell it ourselves and tell each other. Probably my favorite tool is gratitude. And, you know, um, my own routine is to write down three things I'm grateful for every uh, morning before I get off the bed. And um, it started a habit that it's really hard to actually stop at three. So um, it has also some evidence base, but that's uh, that I chose to, to do a talk that is uh, more practical, I, I say, and uh, with you know no evidence. Uh, base, but let me tell you that everything I'm talking about actually has backup. So I'm not sharing the evidence, but I know that uh, they are there. The gratitude, there are so many things that um, are, are, um, are hopeful. So uh, the last tool that I want to talk about is um, a, a phrase that I heard from inspirational uh, speaker and writer, Virginia Brett, who is a Clevelander, and I wanted to make sure I'm giving her credit. She said, no, N-O is a complete sentence. 
No. We really don't own anyone an explanation when we cannot do this or that. So, you know, think about what can you take off your list? You know, the pandemic certainly has allowed us to have, um, to, to reset our priorities, maybe sometimes to even reinvent ourselves and give us an opportunity to maybe take some stuff out of our list, maybe adding something, but certainly um, give us time and opportunity to really choose more carefully the things we commit to. Now, I don't know about you, I find that very, very difficult to do. So my trick is uh, if, if, you know, if I, it's hard to say no immediately, at least I do not say yes. And what I mean by that, if someone would say, hey, can you do X, Y, Z? I'm going to say, let me get back to you. And during that uh, pause, I'm thinking, do I feel like I would want to do this? Do I feel like I have to do this? How does that fit in my uh, priorities, in my goals? How does that fit in my life? And it gives me really clarity as well as strength to go back and say yes or no. And by the way, if you say no to someone without an explanation, you really give them permission to go on, move on, and uh, go ask someone else. So self-care is the foundation of resilience, absolutely not negotiable, period. And I know, I agree with you, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, a lot of people I, I start to see actually even put that in the schedule on their, you know, outlook or whatever a calendar you are using and blocking some time or taking time to breathe or meditate. And it doesn't take that long. Uh, it's just really an intention and a discipline. So now let's move into what resilient people, what do they have in common? And that's what, uh, you know, and what I'm going to share with you is what I read from research as well as hearing from my patients. Yeah, Lee, time to do it. <laughs> that's good. So, but first let's even define resilience. Resilience is the ability to bounce back, to adapt and to recover. It's a practice, it's a set of skills, it's something that all of us can learn and master. Now, it is not a vaccine against trauma, loss, adversity. It's not protecting us from feeling fear, grief, sadness, doubt. Bad things happen to good people. Everyone has been impacted by the pandemic, but let's face it, we didn't wait for the pandemic to really know the roller coaster of life. You know, maybe we remember when, um, when we were six and we, not, we were not picked up uh, to be on the baseball team. Maybe um, we've been diagnosed with um, a difficult or disease. Maybe we got our heart broken. Maybe we didn't get the promotion that we were hoping for. Maybe uh, we find ourselves in divorce court. Maybe we lost someone and on and on and on, right? It happens. But we humans are so complex and so sophisticated that we can really have many feelings, many emotions at the same, at the same time. And the first characteristic of people who are resilient is they accept. That is so tough. They know that stuff happens. Suffering is really part of the human condition. Knowing that help us not to feel a victim. The less time we think about why me, the quicker we can start to recover, the quicker 
we have an opportunity to get back up, to um, get unstuck. The serenity prayer says, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. This is a tough one. It is really tough to accept. Sometimes it feels like it's passive and that, you know, giving, it's like giving up. It's just the opposite of that, frankly. But it takes that jump into uh, to letting go. And when we do, it really provides freedom and energy to focus on the solution, to focus on what we have control instead of what focusing on what we do not have control. One of my favorite equation is uh, E plus R equal O. E is event plus R response or reaction equal outcome. A lot of the time we focus on the outcome. The reality is the outcome is not totally on our control. The only thing, and even that is hard, that is on our control is our response. So think about how many times did you get depleted, frustrated, irritated, annoyed, when you really focus on something that you had no control over it. Well, the pandemic was certainly an example, but we have many, many other examples. Something to think about it. Moving forward, by the way, so, you know, this acceptance stuff, moving forward doesn't mean that we forget what happened. It doesn't mean that um, we don't feel our honor or loss. It means that we are moving forward with the memory, the loss, the pain. Again, we are so complex animals that we can feel many emotions at the same time grief, and joy. I work at University Hospitals in Cleveland, where I had the privilege to serve as the director of the Connor Hall Health, as well as being the chief Hall Health and Wellbeing Officer. I live in healthcare. And I can tell you that nothing is more contagious than emotions. The second trait of people who are resilient is positivity. Positivity is this unstoppable hunt to find what is right. It's not to be optimistic. It's not to pretend everything is great and everything is going to be okay. But it's this intention, this hunt to look for what is right despite it all. It's not easy, again, when we are, you know, bombarded constantly by negativity, by uh, the media or the news, certainly um, bad news sells and the media is uh, daily having a feast at it. So, but, you know, it's up to us to protect ourselves and find a way to limit that, but also to look, despite um, being bombarded with negativity, how do we find positivity. Again, it's not about ignoring the problem, but it's making sure that we have an objective observation of the situation and the acknowledgement of what's good. Looking at all slides of the situation and maybe even finding the silver lining. During the last, you know, couple of years, is there a silver lining for you about the pandemic. We are more resourceful, more creative, 
more apt at finding solutions when we are in a mindset that is willing to acknowledge the good. So I'd like to ask you, just for fun, um, use the chat. Think about one good thing that happened to you over the last 24 hours. Now, don't, don't think too big. It could be you saw a beautiful tree that uh, has flowers, or you find a parking spot right next to what you wanted to do uh, or to go, or you had a delicious cup of coffee, or you had dinner with a loved one. Something good that happened to you over the last 24 hours. Nice sweater, little a gift from a student showing appreciation. Yeah, keep it going. I remember uh, leading a um, psychotherapy group for patients with depression. This is a few years ago, and um, asking that question. And you know, we know that when people are um, living depression, it's really hard to think anything good and to feel anything good. And we are, we're going around, yeah, lunch with Lorenzo Lenzi, that seems fun in person, even better. Uh, great, keep it going. And so finally we go in front of, we call him Henry, and Henry took a long time, but eventually he said, I woke up. Certainly be the alternative. So I start most of my meetings like this in a, in a, you know, at work. And it put us in a different state of mind. I mean, very quickly people smile, giggle, and they feel, because we are, you know, again, human, we are connected with each other. They literally feel the joy, the emotions, the expense of each other. Like when I'm looking at this, I can't help uh, to, um, to sleep, enjoying a, a movie with my partner, working out, going for a walk, having lunch. Yes, yes, yes. All right, awesome. So nothing is more contagious than emotions. And, you know, how do you um, cultivate that um, hunt for yourself and also encourage others to do the same? And, you know, maybe again, that's one way to share your meeting or also uh, we read testimonials, right? And that from patients and that always give, um, a, you know, lift the mood. And especially if it's a difficult meeting, it's even more important because it's literally put us in a state of mind where we are simply more resourceful and more um, um, uh, creative. So the last, um, characteristic of uh, people who are resilient uh, after you know having the ability to accept and then be positive is um, a sense of purpose of meaning. The most uh, one of the most read book in history is man's searching for meaning by Viktor Frankl. Dr. Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist who survived being a, a prisoner, a camp prisoner during World War II. Everyone should read this book, probably more than once. He find really talk about resilience and um, survival through Meaning. So I'm inviting you to, um, to read that book. One of my favorite songs is um, the song, I Will Survive. And she said, as long as I have, I have love to give, I will survive. I have all my life to live, all my love to give, I will survive. 
I love that song. It's from Gloria uh, Gaynor, 1978. I will survive. Yeah, you know what? Uh, it is it is so a beat, but so powerful. I love her message. And I really feel like this is my song. I have an important job, a fancy title, a good income. But at the end of the day, what really, really matters to me is connections. And it's love with a big, big L word. Um, so I believe that the meaning of my life is to love and to be loved. And I'm wondering, you know, for all of you, what is, what is your purpose? What is your meaning? What's giving you courage? What's giving fuel your, your resilience um, when things are really tough? And, you know, some people are having incredible goal and uh, spend their entire life in the pursuit of a cure for um, a disease. And that's, extraordinary and we really are appreciative of that but it could also be something as simple as be kind be a good neighbor so um having those three characteristic again it's something that all of us can aspire to do and to have be more acceptance which really translates into focusing on what we have control which is that much and it's basically this positivity which really is is a is a choice it's an intention doesn't doesn't happen without the willingness to see what is right and then this sense of meaning and um, and purpose to know what really really matters to us, what is going to add fuel uh, to our tank and help us to see the silver lining. If resilience is a learned skill that starts with self-care, it ends with compassion. And more important, self-compassion. Compassion is, is an action word. So if empathy is the ability to feel what someone else feel, I'm able to put myself in someone else's shoes. Compassion is to do something about it. In healthcare, compassion is crucial. You know that there, are, uh, there is um, research showing that it takes less than 13 seconds to establish a compassionate connection with a patient. And the patients who feel that their providers are compassionate are more adherent to their recommendations. They more engage in their own health uh, journey. They are... Um, they, they feel more empowered and therefore um, more equipped to deal with what is and, the, and, uh, and take charge of their health and report a more beneficial and pleasant patient experience. But what's more surprising is that providers, clinicians who are compassionate, experience less burnout. And report less, um, uh, report a, a greater uh, resilience. So being compassionate really doesn't take time, seconds. It's as simple as being an active listener, offering a smile, a hand, suspend judgment. I give you an example, personal example, that was um, frankly life changing for me. It was on a Tuesday morning in 1992. I remember like it was yesterday. I was an intern at the Cleveland Clinic and I just came out of my call, barely slept for 36 hours and I'm rounding with my att attending Dr. Voss. 
very scary, Dr. Voss, by the way. And we run all the interns and the residents and the fellows and the faculty and like in the movie. And we are arriving to the patient that I am presenting. And she is a 22 years old woman hospitalized for uh, endocarditis, infection of the heart following uh, or secondary to IV drug use. She's the mother of five kids from four different fathers and she kept me up most night. I am depleted and guess you, I told you how I become when I'm not managing my stress well. I am at my worst. I um, have no resilience left. I'm judgmental, I'm annoyed. I feel hopeless and helpless of what's coming for her. I feel like I can't help her. And um, this is not a pretty scene. And Dr. Voss stopped me in my track and looked at the group and said, do you think she woke up yesterday morning thinking, how can I ruin my life and the life of my children? And it just had a profound, I still feel my, my heart shaking. It has such a profound impact on me. The moment that, you know, the kind of moment that you remember for the rest of your life and you know this is a turning moment for you. Was I compassionate? Absolutely not. I was judgmental. But the moment I felt compassion for this young woman, the moment I felt better, and I felt that maybe there is hope, and maybe I can do something to help her. When I started to uh, suspend judgment and um, knowing that all of us uh, we have shortcomings and we make mistakes and uh, we just need each other. So I share that with you because again, I feel like this compassion, it is so important. And, uh, and again, it required intention like everything, everything else I talk about today. But now, uh, what about the most difficult of all? self-compassion. We all have an inner critic that is so harsh. We are so quick to remember and not to forget our failures or mistakes. We judge ourselves so harshly. Let's be wild and imagine that you would treat yourself as you would treat someone you love. Celebrating small or big victories. Giving yourself unconditional love. Particularly when you fall short. Willing to remember your humanity. Try it. It will only bring out the better version of yourself. And again, build your resilience. So kind of trying to wrap things up here. We talk about the importance of resilience and the fact that resilience is something that we can all have, learn, build, but it requires practice. It's not something that you get once and then oof, off you go. It's something literally you have to work at it every day Kind of like, you know, we're stopping at the gas station regularly to fill the tank of a car. And we talk about the fact that self-care is absolutely not negotiable. It is key, starting with the basics, as well as uh, maybe adding some tools to manage your, your stress. We talk about the fact that People who are resilient um, know how to focus on things that they have control. They accept and accept that thing is a very active um, word. It's not passive. 
required, you know, it's a, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's the opposite of being passive. We talk about positivity, and then we talk about how important it is to find meaning and have a purpose and know what matters, what matters to us, what matters to each other. Um, and then we wrap up with uh, the need to be compassionate with each other because it actually feeds us. You know, again, people, physicians and clinicians who are compassionate have less, oh yeah, I want to emphasize that because maybe I didn't say it clearly. Physicians who are compassionate and patients report that those physicians are more compassionate, express less burnout. And it's not the other way around. So we would think, okay, if I am not burnout, I'm able to be compassionate. Well, not, not always, but what is for sure that if I am compassionate, I have a much better chance not to be burnout. What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Nietzsche, a famous German philosopher from the 19th century said that. I think that what it means is what did we learn? What did we learn over the last two years? What do you know that was helpful? What do you know that was harmful to you? What can you give yourself permission to celebrate? What mistake did you make? What lesson did you learn? Did you find a silver lining? Maybe, you know, you reset some goals or some priorities. I talk about the fact that I really would like us um, to set an intention and to set a call, you know, I'm inviting us to set a, a call for, um, for action. Remember what I said about emotions. Nothing is more contagious than emotion. So what about if, you know, after today, and I know we're going to learn um, a lot from the next uh, two speakers, you know, and um, the GW continue to do amazing programming uh, on that specific topic. What about if we work collectively on our resilience? And we not only survive, but we thrive despite it all, despite all the things we went through over the last two years. And if it was only the pandemic, but let's face it, we, we, we had so much more climate change and war and social um, distress and, and, and politics and on and on and on. So we can wait. We, we know what do we, what do we decide to to do together, individually, for sure. But since, you know, I suspect that all of us here are givers, uh, what can we do together to, to really impact um, our environment and, uh, and each other? Something that I, I'd love for us to continue to reflect during this afternoon, um, and keep at it, certainly it doesn't stop by five o'clock this Friday. You know, what is the, the tool, the tip, the practice that we are willing to commit? Maybe a simple, you know, single steps. Maybe it's, we're going to practice gratitude for the next week. Maybe it's positivity. Maybe it's to smile more. What is it? What is one step that you are going to uh, able to be willing to commit to make your world a better place. But if your world is a better place, we all will benefit from that. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, 
going to the end of my presentation, I, it's been really a, a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I am very much uh, looking forward to see you all in a few, uh, in a couple of hours for questions. And uh, I'll be on the chat with you uh, for the next uh, couple of hours. So Lee, again, big thank you. Uh, so, so appreciated to be with you this afternoon and uh, waiting for the rest of the day uh, to continue our, our dialogue. Well, thank you so much. That was really, really wonderful, as I, I knew it would be. Uh, and there's a lot for us to chew on, but I think it really also sets the stage for everyone else who's going to come behind you, who are, will dive in a little bit deeper. And then I hope everyone's thinking about questions for that panel discussion. You can put them in the Q&A feature now or as they come to you. Um, you can also put them in the chat, but I'd prefer you not do that because it makes it a little more difficult for me to keep them organized, but I will pull what I can. Um, and then I just want to say uh, that I am also really excited about the next speaker, and I will be turning this over to uh, my partner for the Integrative Medicine Programs uh, and the founder of the programs, Dr. Andrew Heyman. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, you know, I when I was told that um, I would have the honor of introducing uh, Dr. Gordon, it, it actually made me a little nervous. And the reason is because of um, I would say his, you know, I was thinking about what, what do I want to say? And since, you know, I've known him for many, 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 many years. And, you know, he's had this sort of over large impact on, on my life and, and the trajectory of my career. Um, and, you know, every once in a while you meet someone who, who is, uh, you, you know, a, a change agent in the most profound way. Um, it, it's certainly not an overstatement to say Dr. Gordon um, is not only sort of a founder of the field in general, um, but someone who's had the ability to imprint his vision on so many people in so many areas of, of, um, of healthcare. And certainly uh, I, I'm one of those, and he might not realize the degree to which uh, he's had that impact on my life. And I'm sure there are many people out there like me who you know, we're fully inspired by him. And, you know, I, ha I have his, his bio here and it's, it, it feels very narrow to me and I'll read parts of it. And I want to fill some other gaps as well that people might not know very much about him. So, you know, Dr. Gordon is Harvard trained. He's a psychiatrist. And of course he's internationally recognized, especially in his work in self-awareness and self-care and, and uh, group support. Um, he's the founder of the nonprofit Center for Mind Body Medicine in Washington, D.C., and a clinical professor at Georgetown uh, Medical School, and was the chairman of the presidents under President Clinton and G.W. Um, Bush of the White House Commission on Complementary and Alternative Medicine Policy. Uh, it was in 1991 that he founded the Center for Mind Body Medicine, and the orientation was to create a healing community and a community of healers to make self awareness, self care, and group support central to all of healthcare and to training of healthcare professionals and the education of, of children. Um, he leads an international faculty of 130 who've trained more than 6,000 clinicians, educators, and community leaders. Uh, they've in turn brought the CMBM's therapeutic and educational programming to many hundreds of thousands of traumatized and stressed adults and children, as well as people confronting challenges of anxiety, depression, and, and uh, chronic and life-threatening illnesses. Uh, he is a peacemaker and a consensus builder and known for his cross-cultural relationship building as well as deep life-changing therapeutic work for individuals, families, and groups. Uh, he's been doing this for more than 25 years, going into uh, traumatized areas, um, you know, most recently within the Ukraine and, and the Balkans, Middle East, Africa. I remember in the early days, Kosovo, uh, but also for climate-related disasters in Louisiana, Texas, California, Puerto Rico, and Haiti. Uh, as well as communities affected by uh, school shootings and with active uh, duty U.S. military and veterans and families. Uh, more recently, over the past three years, uh, he's done some work with the Lakota tribe and uh, with tribal elders, teachers, and clinicians in the Pine Ridge Indian Reservations in South Dakota to create a program that's married mind-body medicine to traditional Lakota healing uh, and has been able to stem the tide of youth uh, suicide. His latest book, the Transformation, Discovering Wholeness and Healing After Trauma, helps us understand that trauma will come sooner or later to all of us. And trauma, he explains, is a human experience 
as opposed to a pathological anomaly. Um, Nobel Peace Prize Laureate Archbishop Desmond Tutu has said of Dr. Gordon, you're really amazing and we give great thanks to God uh, for the remarkable work you're doing in so many places where God's children are hurting. And I certainly couldn't echo that any uh, more. I, I, I think back to uh, his early work, actually, believe it or not, he wrote several books on cults. Do you remember that, Dr. Gordon, in the early days funded to identify how individuals uh, would uh, sort of succumb in a sense to, you know, kind of a, a group think and then, um, and then offer a pathway out of that. Um, but I also think back to your work um, with another mentor of mine who also had a profound impact, Dr. Max Heyrich. And um, this was, uh, the, the great insight for me was the role that loving kindness and compassion and mindfulness and traditional healing methods would intersect around social consciousness and social change for those groups that are marginalized, whether it was the civil rights movement, the reaction to the Vietnam War, the women's movement, the holistic health movement. Uh, I don't think people understand the degree to which Dr. Gordon's imprint across many different parts of um, society in our country um, has been present in ways that are sort of deep and uh, profound. Um, in addition to that, sort of the influence that he's had on my life where he showed me that even in the most broken of individuals, the most powerful interventions are often the most simple and ones that are right at our disposal. And he showed me the role that these interventions can play in at-risk groups and in marginalized groups in the um, hardest to reach areas of Washington, DC, for example. And that's where I started my work with him in 1994 and 95. And to show me that despite the powerful nature of drugs and surgery, the role of self-care and mindfulness and community and compassion can play in a really um, powerful way. Um, so I'm deeply grateful that you're here with us today. Mm. Thank you, Andy. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very moved by your introduction and by you. This, this work that, uh, that I do, that I'm going to share with all of you today, is uh, you're an embodiment of it, Andy. The whole idea here is to, as we make discoveries about ourselves, as we learn how to better understand and care for ourselves, to be able to share that with others and to serve, to serve others. And um, so I'm very moved by what you had to say, and, and I'm very pleased to be here with all of you, Lee and Jeanette, uh, Francoise, and with, with Misha Kogan, uh, who's here as well. And to uh, be part of this, even though I'm a professor at Georgetown, I feel very much a part of the GW community and I'm glad to be. And, and what I'm going to do uh, in this next 50 or 60 minutes or so is to share with you a perspective on trauma and uh, how we approach it at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. And then um, I'll conclude with some a little bit of sharing with you uh, what I've been doing in uh, Poland and Ukraine. Just got back from Ukraine, where we're working, beginning to create a program of population-wide trauma healing for the people of Ukraine. And I'll be going back again in a couple of weeks. And when I was talking with Misha Kogan, we were corresponding about something else. He said, make sure you talk about Ukraine when you come to <laughs> so, so I, I will at the end. But, but I think what, it, what Andy said is so, is so beautiful because what we're talking about is a way of being and learning and serving that any of us can do and that we can share with others and that um, as we share it with them, uh, we're also, that's, that's our work. My, the work that I do and I believe in one way or another, the work that all of us do is, is all about service and it's about service 
without self-righteousness. It's about, <laughs> it's about service without dogma. It's about service with love and compassion and uh, intelligence and discrimination. So let me, uh, let me give you a talk and then uh, along with uh, the others, I'll be happy at the end to come back and, and, and respond to questions. So Catherine Fleischer is helping me. If I get Catherine, I think you may need you to get me started on this um, on this presentation because it often I can't see the slides coming up yet. Catherine, can we get the slides? Because I I'm not I'm not able to advance them here. Okay, hey, well, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Catherine, are you there? All right, I'm gonna have to communicate with her somehow. But I think what, I think what I'll do is um, while I'm waiting for her to help, I'm gonna do something a little bit out of order. I'm gonna teach you a technique that I was gonna teach a little bit later on, but one for which I don't need a slide and one that's perfectly appropriate now. I, I don't know how many of you get frustrated by technology. Lee, what about you? <laughs> Me too. There, there are a few things on, on, the, on the planet that get me quite as wound up as when technology doesn't work. Uh, partly because I'm so ignorant and haven't learned very much about it. And, and one of the things that I've found is that everything that we teach when we talk about mindfulness or meditation or mind-body medicine, it, it's very, very practical. And one of, the, uh, one of the arenas in which I really need to practice uh, relaxation and awareness is when I'm contending with technological difficulties. So I'm going to teach you a technique that's fundamental to the work we do at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. And uh, it's called soft belly breathing. And it's a, a very simple, Andy mentioned simple technique. Simple is so beautiful. Simple technique for balancing the fight or flight response, for coming into physiological and psychological balance. And all that's required is for us to breathe. It doesn't cost anything. You don't have to go anywhere in particular. You don't have to uh, spend any money. Uh, you don't have to put on special clothes. You don't have to join a group. All that's necessary is to relax and pay attention to our breath. So I'm going to ask you to sit comfortably. And I don't... Uh, do I get on the screen along with the slides or is it just the slides? We can see you too, but you're small. Ah, uh, okay. So if everyone, right now, I don't want you to see anything. <laughs> right now, all you need to do is allow your breathing to deepen. And breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth with your belly soft and relaxed. This is a very relaxing way to breathe. And what I'm teaching you now is a concentrative meditation. It's concentrating on the breath coming in through your nose and going out through your mouth, on our bellies softening and relaxing as we breathe out, and concentrating also on the word soft as we breathe in, and belly as we breathe out. And I recommend closing the eyes because it removes a great deal of external stimulation. So if that's comfortable for you, I invite you to do it. If it's not, you can keep your eyes open, but just let your focus be soft and gentle. Breathing slowly and deeply like this in through the nose and out through the mouth with belly soft and relaxed. More air goes to the bottom of our lungs where there's better oxygen exchange. 
And oxygen, as you know, feeds all the organs and all the cells in our bodies. So as more oxygen enters our bloodstream, because we're breathing slowly and deeply, and more air is coming to the bottom of our lungs, we're feeding all the organs and cells in our bodies. Breathing slowly and deeply like this in through the nose and out through the mouth with the belly soft and relaxed activates the vagus nerve. That's V-A-G-U-S. Vagus means wandering in Latin. And this big nerve wanders up from our belly, through our chest, back to our central nervous system, to our brains. When we activate the vagus nerve by slow, deep, soft belly breathing, we lower blood pressure, slow heart rate, relax the big muscles in our bodies and improve our digestion. And as we continue to breathe slowly and deeply in through the nose and out through the mouth with our bellies soft and relaxed, the quiet activity in the amygdala A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A, -A, a center of fear and anger in our emotional brain. So breathing slowly and deeply like this in through the nose and out through the mouth, with the belly soft and relaxed, is the antidote to the fear and anger, to the hypervigilance and tension of the fight or flight response. And as we continue to breathe slowly and deeply, we also enhance activity in the frontal part of our cerebral cortex in areas responsible for thoughtful decision-making and self-awareness and compassion. And one branch of the vagus nerve connects with other nerves that are responsible for facial expression and speech. So when we breathe slowly and deeply, in through the nose and out through the mouth, we keep on breathing like this with our bellies soft and relaxed. We're quieting our bodies calming the fear and anger in our minds, enhancing our capacity to think clearly and be self-aware, opening the doors to compassion for ourselves and others, and enabling ourselves to tune into other people's facial expressions and their speech so that we can bond with them. All this from slow, deep, soft belly breathing. And as you continue to breathe this way, slowly and deeply, in through the nose, out through the mouth, you can feel all the muscles in your bodies relaxing. So feel that now. Feel the muscles in your belly, and your pelvis and your buttocks relaxing as you exhale. Feel the muscles relax in your legs and feet as you exhale. Feel the relaxation now all up and down your spine. Let those muscles go as you exhale. Feel 
Feel the muscles relax now in your chest and shoulders. We carry a lot of tension, most of us in our shoulders. Let those muscles relax. Feel the relaxation in your arms and hands. Feel the relaxation now in the muscles of your neck and face and head. Feel your whole body relax with each exhalation. To deepen this relaxation, remember to say to yourself to concentrate on soft as you breathe in and belly as you breathe out. If thoughts come, let them come, notice them, let them go. Gently bring your mind back to soft belly. Just a few more slow, deep, soft belly breaths. Now slowly, gently open your eyes. And let your attention come back into the room, onto the screen. So welcome back. Uh, you may see if you're seeing me, <coughs> excuse me, you're likely seeing me smile. That's what happens spontaneously. As I come into this relaxed state after a few minutes, maybe we did this for 10 or 12 minutes, a smile often just comes onto my face. It's kind of like a, my, my, my mind body, my being is pleased with itself, pleased with simply being and breathing. Um, if I were able to see you, uh, I would be able to see your response when I ask how many of you notice a change. The only one I can see is Lee. So did you notice any change from before till after, Lee? Oh, it's like night and day. And I also spontaneously smile at the end as well. That's beautiful. So, it, and you know, the, the this technique is simple and very, very potent in any group that I've worked with, including in very difficult situations, including sometimes in the middle of a war, 70, 80, 90% of people notice a change. And that's very important. It's important because it is giving us the message, you can make a difference in how you feel. When we have been traumatized, when we're depressed, when we're dealing with chronic illness of any kind, there is a tendency, if not a likelihood, that we're gonna feel at least somewhat hopeless and helpless. It's been going on so long. I don't know if I can make a change. I don't know if it's ever going to change. Simply doing soft belly breathing gives us the message, change is possible, I can make it happen. It's not about, anybody preaching to you. It's, 
not even about reading the research, although that's helpful. It's your own experience that's telling you that, that there is some control. And even in the middle of a war, you may not be able to stop the bombs from falling or the homes from being destroyed, but you can at least have some control over how you react, how you respond. And as you feel that sense of control, it becomes easier, easier to deal with even extremely difficult situations. And the way our mind works, the message is not only that we're not helpless, that we can help ourselves, but we're not hopeless. Because if we can make one change, the mind understands that other change is also possible. So this is a beautiful technique. Um, there are on the Center for Mind Body Medicine website, you can take a look at it, I teach it. Uh, the script for it uh, is there in my book, Transforming Trauma. Uh, so simple, so simple to use. Uh, we did it 10 or 12 minutes now. We use soft belly breathing at the beginning of all our meetings at the Center for Mind Body Medicine, and usually at the end, to begin, let go of what's been happening, to come into the present moment, and then when we're getting ready to leave, to let go of where we have been and be ready for what's next. So what's next now is I think I'm gonna be able to show you some slides. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, this is a little bit about the Center for Mind Body Medicine. And again, is there a way we can make these slides available to people if they'd like them? They already are actually. Janet has them in a Dropbox, and you will. Uh, the link is in the chat, but I'm sure she'll pop it in there again. Fantastic. So, um, as you heard from Andy, I started the Center for Mind Body Medicine in 1991, and for exactly the reasons that uh, that that he, that he described, I wanted to help. I, I, I decided that the best way for me to work was not to work within. Georgetown, where I was and am a clinical professor, that I would have the freedom that I needed uh, while still doing work at Georgetown, the freedom that I needed to work with people in institutions and practices and communities all over. And I didn't know how far it would extend, but I knew that if I created my own organization, I could help people like those of you at GW to move ahead and make the changes that you wanted to make. And that where it was appropriate, I could be somebody who could help you to do that. And that's the role that I've taken. That's the role the Center for Mind-Body Medicine has taken. We are teaching, we're sharing, we're training people. We're offering what we have to offer and saying, here it is. And make use of it as much as you'd like. Partner with us as deeply as you would like. And I, I need help in advancing. It got stuck again. There we go, this is the center. These are some of the places uh, we've worked in, we've grown since the little bio that Andy was reading. We have 160 international faculty. Uh, here are some of the places where we're working uh, in the US and around the world. And we've trained about, probably about 7,000 people now have come through our mind-body medicine training and another 3,000 through our new, uh, comprehensive nutrition training, our food as medicine program. This is, I, Andy and I can say nice things about the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. Here's somebody totally outside, uh, this is Tina Rosenberg for the New York Times, uh, speaking about the program we're doing with veterans. Uh, and now that program has grown significantly. We're now working with the largest division of the VA. One of the things that's happening, and I suppose the, um, one, of, one of the reasons the seminar is happening is because the world is changing, that more and more people and more and more health professionals are realizing we need something more. We need to shift the way we're doing things. We need to focus more on self-care and mutual support. We need to reach out and include the healing methods of other, um, other people, of indigenous people, as well as some of the high classical systems of medicine like Indian Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine. So we're in a larger world now. And the medicine for trauma that we're sharing, which I'll come to uh, in, in a little bit, 
is not just in this spirit of expanding what medicine is about. We're both expanding, but we're also um, returning to our roots. The word radical is it means from the roots. And we're going back to the roots of medicine in the systems of indigenous people. And there was an understanding, and there still is an understanding among indigenous people. Of course, you have to treat an illness or a physical trauma or distress as it arises. And yes, that's the first level. That's the first level of healing. The next level is going to the causes, going to whether they're nutritional or exercise or whatever the social causes, economic causes, looking at the causes. And the highest level of our profession, of our vocation, of our calling, is to help ourselves and other people live in harmony with our nature and with the natural, social, and spiritual world. So it's, a, it's, a, it's more than prescribing drugs. It's more even than doing preventive medicine. Uh, and perhaps we can think of it as the true public health, the health for all the people. This is a quote that's been important to me from Franz Kafka, who uh, was a great Czech writer. He wrote in German and lived uh, over a hundred years ago and lived through the First World War and knew suffering, personal suffering, collective suffering. And he said, with such wisdom, you can hold yourself back from the sufferings of the world. That is something you're free to do. And it accords with your nature. But perhaps this very holding back is the one suffering you could avoid. I want to make a little correction to my, to my teacher, Franz Kafka. I don't know if that's our nature. Kafka got kind of cynical. Uh, understandably, if you knew how he grew up and the world he lived in. Um, I'm not sure. I think it accords with our practice and with our social ideas that we should hold ourselves back from suffering. But in fact, what I have found, what I continue to find, is that when I allow myself to experience the suffering that is mine and when I allow myself to respond with an open heart to the suffering of others, I relieve my suffering. Avoidance doesn't do it. Suppressing, pretending it's not there, it all comes back, all comes back later on. We do that to protect ourselves, but we don't do that to heal ourselves, to heal ourselves we need to allow ourselves to experience the suffering that comes to us, not the unnecessary suffering, but the true pain that's really there. And then to allow ourselves to be present with others, to be available to others who are also suffering. So trauma. Trauma is a word that has become um, very widely used. And I think basically it's a good thing because we need to pay attention to trauma, to the injury, to body, mind, and spirit. It's a Greek word that means injury. To the body, mind, and spirit, the trauma that will come to all of us. None of us is immune. Up till fairly recently, we've had the idea that trauma, that only comes to those other people, combatants or civilians in the middle of a war, people with the most horrific childhoods. In fact, it's not true. Trauma is a part of human life. It may come early in life. If we have a congenital abnormality, if there's a lot of sickness, if we're not properly cared for, if our parents are poor, or our neighborhood is violent. If it doesn't come then, it may well come in young adulthood or midlife as we suffer disappointments and losses of meaningful relationships or disappointments in our career or death of parents or grandparents. And if it doesn't come then, it will surely come as we grow old and become physically frail 
and face inevitable losses and our inevitable death. It's a part of life. Now, major causes are here. These are some of the ones that are most obvious of trauma. You can read this for yourself at your leisure. One way to think about the consequences of trauma is that the human organism, as it grows and develops, it becomes both more complex and more capable of specialization. And if you think of yourself growing up and uh, coming into your late teens and 20s, you know, you're, you're able to deal with much more. You sort of, you know, can get you wrap your arms around more and you can think things through more clearly and you can respond with more parts of yourself and your own history. You, you becoming more complex. That's part of the process of, um, of development. And also you can focus, focus in a way you may never have been able to before. When trauma comes, it disrupts that process of growth and development. And it disrupts it in two ways. One is it can create chaos, agitation, fearfulness, difficulty focusing, difficulty concentrating, just uh, uh, uneasiness, uh, or it can shut us down and keep us from moving forward. And sometimes, often enough, it does both. They're working with the um, New York City firefighters after 9-11. And you may remember or have read that over 300 firefighters died on 9-11. And all the firefighters looked at each other as brothers and sisters. There weren't too many sisters at that time, but they were part of the family as well. So when those 300, and they happened to be all guys, when they died, it was like brothers had died. And the firefighters who survived, many of them um, had, had kind of manifestations of both this chaotic agitation and also the exhaustion and the inability to move forward um, that are the two major aspects of, um, of what happens to us when we've been traumatized. Post-traumatic stress disorder, psychiatric diagnosis, um, that I'd like to think of in this context, that in post-traumatic stress or the disorder, which means the symptoms of post-traumatic stress coupled with an inability to function normally, the fight or flight response that is meant to protect us from a predator that we you know, owe to our vertebrate ancestors. It's there, all vertebrates have fight or flight response. It continues, either because the trauma is continuing, as it has through the COVID pandemic. I don't know how many people, just about everybody I know, um, has experienced some trauma from the pandemic and has experienced some agitation, some more difficulty sleeping, some difficulty focusing, maybe more irritable with the kids or kids more impatient with, uh, with, 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 with their parents. And many, many people have also had that frozen, shut down feeling that um, is also at its base of a life-saving mechanism, playing possum, for example. It's a, a way to preserve oneself from a predator who you hope will ignore you. Well, that's a little bit of a projection or teleology onto animals. I don't know if they're hoping or not, but they have responses that do protect themselves, like the mouse in your, if your pet cat catches mice and the cat's carrying around the mouse in its mouth, the mouse will be kind of slumped over. It may be slumped over because it's dead, but it may also be slumped over because it's gone into a freeze response. It's shut down. And what happens, and I've watched this, I used to live on a farm with a bunch of cats. Um, cat will put the mouse down. And if the mouse is still alive, she'll shake herself off. Psh run off to the mouse hole. She was in freeze response. It came quickly and left quickly. Fight or flight also comes quickly and leaves quickly. The, the gazelle at the watering hole and the lion comes and chases. If she gets away, three minutes later, she's happily grazing. When we have been traumatized and the trauma is not resolved, 
fight or flight and freeze persist and they shut us down. They um, inhibit us. They make us agitated, make us anxious, hypervigilant. All of these things come. So the work of trauma healing begins with creating antidotes to both fight or flight and freeze response. And here's a picture. Um, these are kids, high school students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, where they suffered the trauma of a school shooting that killed 17 people, 14 students and three, three staff. And they're doing soft belly breathing. And incidentally, we train, we're training these young people to use mind-body medicine with, with adults and with uh, people their age and with people who are younger. So they are now leading mind-body skills groups and sharing these skills in classrooms and with, with other students and with their parents. Another way to think about trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder is that it's a kind of fixation. We're stuck. Even if the trauma has passed, as with the firefighters whom I described, or with these kids, they're still replaying in nightmares, in flashbacks, the trauma that they have experienced. So trauma is a kind of fixation. And meditation, what meditation does is it dissolves that fixation. It unsticks us. It allows us to move into the moment, allows us to be present and to move forward so that the nightmares and the flashbacks, even when they happen, they no longer have the capacity to drag us back for the rest of the day into that distressed state. We see them as we wake, we learn to relax with them. And the more we use techniques like soft belly breathing, the more able we are to free ourselves from the consequences of trauma. So I've said it here already, Post-traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic stress is a mixed picture. And prolonged fight or flight and prolonged freezing. So agitation, feeling overwhelmed, intrusive thoughts, nightmares, all of, all of those things come. As I said, trauma healing begins with restoring psychological and physiological balance. And here are some kids in Haiti where we've been working since 2010, since the earthquake. And there's their teacher in the front of the room getting them to do an active expressive meditation. Um, they, these kids, they crack me up. I was just, what, one of the things about doing this work, and I just want to say this to all of you, is the work you do should be a joy. So the work, you know, and, Whatever it is, whether you're whether you're a surgeon or you're a psychotherapist or you're you're a you know you're a, a licensed practical nurse, whatever you are, it should it should be a work that is joyful for you. And it's one of the reasons I like to spend at least some time with kids because it's just about always fun to work with them. So we're using here expressive meditations, and there are basically three kinds of, of meditation. There are thousands of techniques. Concentrated meditation, we did maybe seven or 8,000 years old, as best we know, from scriptures from Northern India. There's mindfulness meditation, becoming aware of thoughts, feelings, and sensations as they arise. And then there's expressive meditation. And these are the oldest ones on the planet. If you go to the caves in the south of France or in Spain, north of Spain, you'll see the humans dancing with the animals. It's an expressive meditation. It's the hunt, but the hunt is a meditation as well. And expressive meditations are foundational for dealing with psychological trauma. And here, uh, here I am with Rosemary Lombard, who is the, now, I'm the, now the CEO at the, we've changed our titles a little, I'm the CEO, she's the executive director, we're here in New Orleans at an intentional community called Bastion for American, uh, American service members with traumatic brain injury. And we're there for a day. Uh, we're talking about my book. I'll show you. 
I'll show you the book. I can people see the book here. Uh, we have a different title from the one that Andy mentioned. It's now called Transforming Trauma. Anyway, we're there to celebrate Bastion, to do a book signing for the book. And uh, we did some expressive meditation with the people who were there. Expressive meditations are the best for that physical tension, for that rumination, for bodies that have been shut down and depleted and frozen by trauma. And when you do expressive meditations, they also bring up emotions that have been buried. Once again, uh, at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine website, we don't have time to do it right now. You can watch me teaching, shaking and dancing, uh, which is one of the expressive meditations. And I think fast, deep, chaotic breathing as well. And the whole script for it is in transforming trauma. And you can do this, the shaking and dancing, which is the simplest one anybody can do. There are some, you know, some caveats for the very fast, deep breathing. But shaking and dancing, you can do it if you're in a wheelchair. And just do it. Do it for five minutes of shaking, a couple minutes of being quiet and still, and then letting your body move to music. Very simple, very powerful, and it breaks up and melts those trauma frozen bodies and gets to bring up some of those emotions that we suppress because they're uncomfortable or they scare us or because we think we're not supposed to have them. This is one of the, um, one of the sort of terrible calamities of our society is that we look, uh, and, and of our medical work as well, we look askance at emotions. One of the difficulties for people I don't know how many of you experienced this during the pandemic is feeling so overwhelmed by what's going on and not feeling it was okay to say, you know, I don't feel good or I'm so angry or I'm so sad or I'm so, because we're supposed to be so tough. We're supposed to be stoical and tough it out and get through it. I, I work a lot with cops and veterans as well as with health professionals. It's all the same. That idea, you got to get through it. If you really, if you're a real professional at this job, you don't show your emotions. But what happens is we suffer. We suffer unnecessarily. Whereas if we can allow the emotions to come up, if we can allow that freedom, then it's not only the uncomfortable emotions that will arise more easily, it's also the ones of joy and of pleasure and of kindness and of love that come up more easily. We have to we have to break up these fixed patterns. And once we start to do that, then everything else that we may use for healing becomes so much easier. And this is a group, Sabrina, my dear friend and colleague, my sister Sabrina and Jai, who's in yellow there, is leading a small group. And I think this is, I'm trying to think this may be in New Orleans. I'm not sure where this is, wherever we're working. And it's just to say, to remind me to say to you that all the other techniques that you may use, um, whether it's conventional medical techniques or self-care techniques or psychotherapy, everything works much better, comes more easily once we begin to bring ourselves into physiological, psychological balance. I'm looking at the time. Okay, gr groups are very important as part of this process. Um, this is our clinical director, Linda Rixmeyer Sear, and she's, when we do a training program, we may have 200 people in a training, we'll have 20 of our faculty, 20 of those 160 faculty, and they will be leading small groups with 10 people in each group. Once again, our Aboriginal brothers and sisters have understood this for as long, just about as long as there have been humans is that when you have a significant issue or problem, a group enhances significantly and may even be necessary to the healing that we need. In traditional societies, the ones I know of, if you have a minor problem, you've got a cold, you've got a little sprain, you're having a little trouble with your spouse or your partner, or your kids, you go to your granny, your grandmother or somebody else's granny, and she's got the, you know, she's got the appropriate teachings to give you. If it's a big problem, life-threatening illness, psychosis, suicidal thoughts, you go to the official healer. 
whatever that official healer's name is. Witch doctor. I have a friend in Mozambique, a colleague in Mozambique, who calls himself Dr. Witch. <laughs> Wise woman, Kurundero, Sangoma. Shaman. And those people will most often bring a group together for the healer. We use groups in our training. We teach you how to lead these groups. Those kids from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School are learning how to lead groups. And here are some of the principles of the group. I won't go through this in detail. Uh, once again, you can read much more about these groups, both on our website and also in Transforming Trauma. But the groups are meditative. We're encouraging people to be present in the moment. And you're there for yourself. And we create a safe place with confidentiality where everybody has a chance to speak. Nobody's shortchanged and nobody's more important than anybody else. Everybody's respected. Every group you learn a technique. One of the reasons many groups get a little old rather fast is because people just are repeating the same thing over and over again. Our groups, there's a kind of dynamism to it because each group, you're learning a tool or technique and then you're sharing with others what you've learned. So there's both a, a sense of self-discovery, a sense of learning and growing and a sense of connection and sharing with other people. Other thing that's really important is that the leader also shares. This is a different model. In a sense, it's a democratization, not only of medicine in the broadest sense of the word medicine, but of the role of the healer. Shamans, they used to do it. They knew the, they knew the drill, they knew the skills. They didn't tell anybody else about it. Doctors, a little bit the same. We know we got the answers, we're gonna do it. We got, we'll write the prescription. This is a different model. And I'm not saying that's necessary at times. But for most of the issues, most of the problems that most of us have most of the time, there is no magic bullet. There is no surgical procedure that's going to make everything okay. And we have the capacity to do it ourselves. And our work is to teach people how to do it themselves. People of every age and educational level. And once we embark on this path, we not only can relieve the symptoms and come back into balance, we can make discoveries and find ourselves in a place of greater meaning and purpose and integrity and love than we've ever been. This is Aboriginal understanding and modern psychology calls it post-traumatic growth. Here's some research. We published about 25 studies on our model. Uh, this is the first randomized control trial of any intervention with war traumatized, not just adolescents, kids at any age. There was an 82% reduction in the numbers of those qualifying for the diagnosis of PTSD after they participated in 11 week, actually 12 week, sometimes 11, sometimes 12 mind body skills groups. Very important finding, obviously very powerful intervention. We've replicated this a number of times with different populations, just as important as the improvement was who led the groups. It wasn't me, it wasn't Linda whom I showed you or Sabrina, it was people we trained. In this case, Rural high school teachers led these groups whom we trained and provided ongoing mentorship and supervision to. We work many places and these are the stages. I won't go into this in detail. If any of you is interested in bringing our program to your organization, your community, your university, please, we can get in touch. But basically just be in touch with me. We reach out. We connect with people. That's what I'm doing in Poland and Ukraine right now. I was just there a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm going back a couple of weeks and uh, reach out to people and see who, who's here, who wants to work with us. In Poland and in Ukraine, it was wonderful psychiatrists who are leaders in their field in their respective countries who have wide range of connections with groups. We create a program. We bring together the people who really want to learn what we have to teach, first for themselves 
and then to share it with others. And we have a comprehensive training program. And you can look on our website, it's 10 days of training, and then it's six months, eight months, a year of mentorship and supervision. And then we develop a local leadership team everywhere we go. So when we've worked with medical schools, uh, everything that we do in the medical school is completely sustainable. After a while, the medical school doesn't need the Center for Black Body Medicine any longer because the faculty in the medical school and or the students have learned the method and they're using it. They're using it with students, they're using it with faculty, they're using it with their patients. And we're there to help and just to make things, uh, when challenges come up, to be there to consult with, to help connect you with the larger universe of people who are doing this work. So we're now working in Ukraine and Poland. And these first couple shots, um, this is just an example, it's a very powerful example right now at this moment in history of, of, of how this work grows. The picture on the left, sitting with a group of Ukrainian psychotherapists in a, um, a, in a house in, a, in the western part of Poland. And they've all fled. These are mostly women. There's one young guy, dad with a little kid, but women and there are some children and grannies, grandmothers with them as well. So, and the, uh, I think that's Eva in the, in the orange sweater. She's the one who brought us to the place. She's the psychiatrist. The other picture, I'm sitting with a psychologist from uh, Ukraine and we're in, this is in Warsaw. And she's telling me about fleeing with her two 10 year old twin daughters and talking to me about how painful it was to leave behind her husband who's fighting. And this is what's happening there is that the women and children are leaving. Uh, by and large, some are, still, some are staying, but many, many are leaving. Their husbands are staying behind. They're fighting. Their lives are obviously at risk. And what is a fight to, a, a fight to the death? Um, I'm not gonna show you this video now. I wanna show you this picture of, um, this is in, uh, in Ukraine. This is in Lviv, in the Western part of Ukraine. And I'm, uh, you want, may wonder why it's red. <laughs> That's because I arrived in Lviv, uh, in Ukraine, and uh, I, I got to, uh, you know, the, the long story about, how to, about the journey there. But I finally got to this, my hotel, and had a meeting and the man on the right is uh, Roman Kecker, who's a very distinguished psychiatrist, professor of psychiatry and uh, leads many of the psychiatric and psychotherapeutic associations in Ukraine. And on, uh, at Roman's right the, the, is a translator, Roxaliana. And the reason everything is red is because as soon, just about as soon as I, our meeting started, air raid sirens went off because Russian planes were flying over. And so we had to go to the uh, red lit basement of the hotel where I was staying. And this is where we, we had our meeting. So I wanted to give you, tell you that just to show you the faces and give you a little feeling for what it's like there. Um, and this, uh, I spent about oh, five or six days in Poland and uh, about as long in Ukraine. And the idea is to reach out to people who are of potential partners, but, and also to understand what's happening there. And, and one of the things that I think is really important that's happening in Ukraine, and that's also happening in its own way in Poland, is that the best in human beings is coming, is coming to the fore. That in Ukraine, everybody is taking care of everybody else. And the welcome that I received and that others received who are friends to the Ukrainian people who have something to offer was so overwhelmingly positive, such, a, such warmth, such openness. And the interest in the tools and techniques that we had to teach was also so great. And the sense is that the trauma, the understanding there is that the trauma, and many people said this quite literally to me, we have 
war and trauma in our DNA. They've been fighting there really since the 1930s. And the fighting, this most recent war, didn't start two months ago or three months ago. It started eight years ago in Crimea when the Russians took over Crimea and Ukrainians began to fight back. And they have been experiencing this trauma in an ongoing way for these eight years. And the DNA is there because the people in Ukraine and, and also the people in Poland lived through both Stalinist oppression, mass murder and deportation, and also the mass murder of the Nazis. So this is very much there. This is, this is part of their identity, part of who they are, part of the trauma that they bring forward from their grandparents and their parents that is now being reawakened in their lives. And so the approach that we're doing, the idea is to um, go to Ukraine as, a, as, as I did, to work on a large scale in Ukraine and also with all those who are working with Ukrainian refugees. Now, up to this point, our largest program was, has been in Gaza, uh, that little strip of land, that occupied territory. And we've trained over a thousand people in Gaza, many of them school teachers and counselors, as well as doctors, nurses, leaders of women's groups, clergy. And they in turn have worked with 280,000 children and adults. And that program is gonna expand significantly the Ministry of Education wants us to work with all 250,000 kids in the public school system. So that's a big program. The program in Ukraine, we're hoping to be able to train several thousand people over time to work with the, an entire population, the population in Ukraine, as well as with the refugees, to train the local people, the psychiatrists and the psychotherapists and the nurses and the teachers and the clergy and the women leaders of women's groups and the leaders in the villages and towns and also the veterans and and the, the people who have been fighting and are still fighting so i want to end with this last picture uh, when i got to the bus station to take the bus from uh Lviv back to warsaw there was a guy there um uh, and there was a, a wonderful Ukrainian woman took me to the bus station and she and I were just sort of looking around. Where is the bus to Warsaw? We were kind of lost. And this guy was there and I just uh, asked him, you know, do you know where the bus to Warsaw is? And it happened he was going on the same bus. And we started talking. And it, it turned out he was a German special forces soldier. Uh, he'd been in German special forces for 12 years. He'd become disillusioned with the military, with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. He moved to Sweden, but when Russia attacked Ukraine, he felt it was necessary for him to be there, that this is the way that he could use the skills, the very high level of military skills he had to help protect the people who were being invaded and being oppressed. So we got to talk and we got to be friends and uh, I gave him a copy of my book <laughs> and we did a little breathing together and uh, he's ready to come to our training in mind-body medicine. So uh, I want to conclude, this is, his name is Martin Otto, and uh, I want to conclude with him because it's such a, it's such a beautiful example of that Kafka quote of his he was not only helping to relieve the suffering of the Ukrainian soldiers and the volunteers, who many of whom, some of whom are professionals, but most of whom don't know what they're doing at all, not only able to help the Ukrainian people, he was able to relieve his own suffering, his own feeling that, that he had not done what he had hoped to do when he decided to become a soldier. He was able to be a soldier in a cause that he felt was just and right. So in a sense, I, this is an invitation to all of you to consider, first of all, to appreciate who you are and what you're doing, and to appreciate the fact that you are, just about everybody who's here, engaged in relieving the suffering of others, 
and that it also is an opportunity for you to relieve your own suffering. So I wanna tell you that first. Second of all, I wanna emphasize the importance of learning how to understand and care for yourself as a basis for teaching others to do the same. You really can't help others to help themselves unless you're also embarked on that journey yourself. And finally, this is an invitation to, um, to join the Center for Mind-Body Medicine to become part of this healing community. And this is just descriptions of what we hope to do in Ukraine um, that you can look at at your leisure. And if, if you want to be part of what we're doing in Ukraine, want to support that work, we invite you to do that. If you want to learn um, how to um, do this work, you can read my book, Transforming Trauma, this wonderful quote from my late friend, uh, Desmond Tutu. Um, and you can, here's the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, and you can connect with us. And here are some ways you can connect with us. Uh, I, I guess you already have the copy of the presentation. We have online mind-body skills groups that you can join, total sliding scale. You pay what you can afford. We're here to train you, to invite you to be part of this training program that we have that's ongoing here in the United States as well as overseas. And if you're interested in a larger partnership, whether it's with the GW community or with other communities to which you belong, please get in touch with us as well. So thank you once again. Thank you, Lee and uh, Jeanette and Andy uh, and for, for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for sharing us, with us your important work. Um, and I hope it's inspirational to many of us who probably could use a little bit of inspiration during this, this difficult time that we're all going through. Um, so with that, we are going to take a quick break until 3.20 uh, when we will move on to our last speaker before the panel session, Dr. Lorenzo Norris. So please do come back at 3.20 and we'll see you soon.
Well, it is 320. I'm not sure if everyone is back yet. So please come back and, and join us. We'll wait just a little bit longer to make sure everyone is here. While we are waiting, if you have any questions, please do put them in the Q&A feature. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the introduction. So next up we have last speaker, but certainly not least, um, our final speaker before the panel session is Dr. Lorenzo Norris. Since arriving at GW in 2006, Dr. Norris has held a variety of leadership positions throughout the GW medical enterprise. Currently, he serves as Chief Wellness Officer, Medical Director for the GW Resiliency and Wellbeing Center, and Associate Dean of Student Affairs and Administration for the GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Norris is also an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Dr. Norris regularly publishes papers in academic journals and has presented at numerous academic symposiums and national meetings. He has guest edited four issues of psychiatric annals with themes ranging from cancer and depression to hope in cancer survivorship. Currently, he serves as the editor-in-chief for MD Edge Psychiatry. Recently, he completed a two-year term as DC chapter president of the Washington Psychiatric Society. Dr. Norris has served as a member of the American Psychiatric Association Council on Psychosomatic Medicine, the Cats and Cancer Research Center for Board of Directors, the Cats and Cancer Research Center Board of Directors, and he was the recipient of the Leonard Tao 2011 Humanism in Medicine Award. He's also been recognized as Washington's top doctor for multiple years. Dr. Norris has been elected to membership in the American College of Psychiatric or psychiatry, and to the group for the advancement for psychiatry. Personally, I have really enjoyed the opportunity to work closely with him in founding the GW Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. In fact, I think we are the perfect partner to do this, and it's been a real pleasure. Um, but as you will see, he is extremely knowledgeable and charismatic. So get ready for an engaging talk. Over to you, Lorenzo. All right. Hey, Lee, thank you so very much for that kind introduction. Um, I wish I would have... Uh, it, Honestly, you really, the, speak, the speakers ahead of us were so, they were just great. I mean, I was just, I, I feel so like, just good, just really good right now. I mean, we could have just said like, Lorenzo's here to talk. So, um, but but with that being said, let's, um, and I echo uh, just uh, uh, in terms of uh, with Lee, Dr. Frame, being with the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. And it really, it wasn't the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center until she came. So uh, that pretty much says it. So, uh, and hopefully what I'm gonna share with you today is just a little bit of the journey in regards to um, the, the center, uh, how it's evolved, and what and kind of maybe share with you a little bit of our Lee and I's approach, what we've learned and what we still need to need to learn. But maybe it will hopefully also build on some of what uh, our already excellent speakers have already talked about in terms of resilience, what that means, growth, acceptance, spirit, and being optimistic and looking forward. And let me just go ahead and get started. All right, so we can make room for this excellent panel discussion. I, I personally got a lot of questions. A lot of questions from the mind body medicine folks, but I got to let other, other people talk. So let's see here. Let me share my screen. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Start slideshow. Okay, thumbs up. Everyone can see my slides. Okay, all right, very good, Tess, great. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk to you today about cultivating realistic optimism across um, a health enterprise. Um, I'd say this with a, a sense of, of certainly humility with everything that we've been through uh, collectively as a population, uh, it's just shared humanity over the past uh, two years. So these are lessons that are learned. And I always I tell folks this all the time, if I say something that makes a little bit of sense, um, that's either because I learned it from uh, one of probably three places, either my colleagues, my patients, or just the universe in general. If I say something and you're kind of like, 
where's he going with it? That's me trying to be academic and cute. So I ask for your forgiveness in regards to that. So let's, with no further ado, let's kind of get right into uh, this, okay? Now, uh, start out with a little something. Uh, I was talking to uh, my daughter um, uh, this week, actually, before uh, she was going to school. And she was like, dad, and I'm like, yeah, Taylor, what's up? She's like, dad, you know, Mondays just suck. It's, they're, they're kind of tough. They're just, I'm like, yeah, it, it kind of is. You know, it's NBA playoffs. I mean, you know, we kind of wanted to see things, even though the Cavs got knocked out. I'm originally from Northeast Ohio. It's just like, Mondays, shouldn't Mondays be optional? I'm like, oh, well, you know, I, I, I see your point. I see your point. We certainly can take a, maybe we can start to think about it. And she's like, nah, they should be optional. I mean, so forget trying to win an argument with like a 15 year old getting ready to turn 16. So I was just like, all right, let me back off. Let me let you come to this on your own. And I started to talk about, well, what is it that you want to do in your life? What is it that we've been talking about? And then she started to talk, she started to talk. And then, you know, by the time we hit the cheese eggs in the morning, um, she's like, you know something? That I think I, I know why Mondays aren't optional. Why? Because easy is not an option. I was like, oh, okay. All right, from the seeds of youth, because I didn't tell her that. Um, but the idea is that anything worth doing, anything where we have to do something, it's not initially easy. We have to put in investment. We have to put in some time. We have to put in some, some effort to it. So as I think, as we go through this talk, and it's just starting to think about maybe your own, if you will, clinic, unit, department, family, community, and how you cultivate things or how you continue to grow in your own unique way, just know that easy isn't, it isn't, it's not an option, but that's okay because that's, in my opinion, that's a very useful thing. All right, a very useful thing. So at the start of the pandemic, um, uh, I still remember uh, Dean Bass, um, we were in some kind of, we were in some uh, meeting and she had just come on board, just come on board, didn't know she was gonna be Dean in the midst of a pandemic. And it probably was like February or March or something of that nature. She said, well, you know, I'll see you guys in a couple of months. And at first I was like, what do you mean she's going she's gonna to see us in a couple of months? That seems a little bit like pessimistic. I mean, what about a couple of weeks? I mean, we're going to figure this whole thing out, right? Uh, wrong. Wrong. All right. Later on, probably two or three months in, I was asked by Dr. Bruno Petano, a GW, a medical director at GW Hospital, to talk about the emotional phases of a disaster response at that point in time. And ever since that, I have been utilizing um, this slide to kind of describe exactly um, how I think about the pandemic, how I think about, if you will, our emotional responses to it. And then also it's going to give you an idea of how the GW Resiliency and Wellbeing Center came about. So again, this is evidence-based and I, I have the, uh, uh, the, if you will, the um, uh, where it came from. But this, to me, this is important, you know, in terms of thinking about our, uh, our emotional responses to a disaster, pre-disaster, impact heroic, honeymoon, disillusionment, reconstruction. I bring this up because every place that I've given this lecture or I've shown this to, everyone in their own unique way, in their own unique community has used this as a way to frame where they are at or what their response patterns could look like. And I find it very useful. I distinctly remember when we entered into the, the impact, the shock, when we entered in the heroic phase, everyone was sewing masks and doing things of that nature. You saw, uh, I still remember the applause if you will, for healthcare professionals. Um, and I should hope definitely for all of those that in general, uh, you can do it for healthcare professionals. You, I applauded uh, my folks at my, the, my local grocery store that was working there without shielding and all of these different things. You can applaud a lot of people. But at the same time, I knew that we were just here. We were just here. And eventually we were gonna go here. So in certain ways, early mid 2019, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Early mid 2019, um, if you will, um, a bit of, if you will, um, a uh, reliance, or I should say 2020, a bit of an over-reliance on the uh, hero complex, okay? Now, when you look at the symptoms, this is actually taken from the Pulse survey, okay? Because uh, we have to understand that in my mind, COVID, COVID actually doesn't necessarily just strictly cause a lot of issues. It just reveals what was already there and compounds it. So this is a pulse symptom survey, which I find also very useful. So in 2019, 
we had, if you will, already very significant levels of anxiety and depression if you just do a pulse check in the, in the population. But in 2020, you could see that those numbers just jumped astronomically, all right, you know, 30%, 24%, 34% for one or both. That's a ma- that is a massive amount. And those of us in health professions, uh, we can tell you that, and certainly in my opinion, I actually thought that that might be a bit of an underestimate, if you want my, my opinion about it. It could have been an underestimate, but we were facing a challenge like no other. Again, this is just another, um, if you will, report of where patient, where people were at in terms of their symptoms of anxiety and depression uh, in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and I think it's important because this, all of this started to lay the ground in terms of the need for the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center here at GW, uh, GW uh, Medical Enterprise. Now, in addition to the anxiety, the depression, and everything that every, and people were going through, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the effect of social isolation, which was massive, okay? Uh, if you look at the evidence, uh, base, when people had to shelter in place, um, not only were they worried, not only were they stressed, it had up to probably a third or 37% a negative mental health effect, okay? Um, and also certain populations could have been a greater risk of adverse mental health outcomes. This social isolation, I think it's going to, I'm trying to tie this into some of the challenges uh, that social isolation uh, caused in regards to resilience, all right? Okay, basically many of the measures that we use uh, to prevent COVID-19 uh, prevented our social interaction. What you need to understand without turning this into a neuroanatomy lesson is that our brains are literally wired to connect. That's how we as humanity have survived and grown. We are literally wired to connect. And if you understand the social brain, you'll understand the effects of social distancing, all right? Um, due to the fact that we are wired to connect, I'm sure many people in this audience will realize it. Um, But when you isolate somebody, you actually can activate the same pain receptors that are activated like if you were to get hit on your elbow or something of that nature. I mean, think about that for a moment. The social isolation in and of itself can trigger a pain response. And while to this group that may seem very obvious, to many others that was not. I don't know, I can't see everybody, we can't get a, a, a show of hands, but I know, I, I don't know how many people have to socially isolate. I did once, all right? Um, and I, I did it in my house and I have a very comfy house with family. I gotta tell you, it was awful. It was awful. I mean, I still, even though they were there, I still felt disconnected. Just the idea of not being able to reach out or knowing I could interact with folks, even with my training in psychiatry, self-care, all of this, it still was very difficult. So I can only imagine how that was for um, others. So this social isolation had a massive effect. And I'm going to, it not only did it take away from our ability to connect, I'm going to say that it really pushed our ability, our frustration tolerance, as well as our resilience to the limit. Okay. Now, Healthcare professionals, okay. Um, in the midst of COVID, um, this is just one line of evidence. Uh, Twenty to twenty-five percent of healthcare professionals were experiencing um, anxiety, depression, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, so our healthcare professionals were really being pushed in ways that they had never, for most of them, had never been pushed. Before, I had the, um, I was actually, it's interesting, I, I believe one of the speakers was speaking about 9-11. Um, I actually was in New York during 9-11. Uh, actually, I was an intern at Mount Sinai Hospital uh, in 9-11. And I still remember uh, there, them speaking about some, a code I had never heard. And I was asking somebody, uh, I was just, I was coming from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, Case Western grad, born and bred, so uh, definitely recognized the university hospitals, uh, symbol from uh, Dr. Don. Um, so, but basically when I was at Mount Sinai, I still remembered when that code came and I, of course I was an intern, I didn't know anything. So I was just kind of like, what does that mean? And they said, it's a terrorist attack code. I'm like, what? 
a terrorist who? Who's who's doing what? That doesn't make any sense. So when I was in New York at that time, I still remember NYU and the lower uh, part of New York getting absolutely over the next couple of weeks getting hammered uh, with just the emotional toll, the tra- the loss of life, the tragedy, everything they had to deal with. Why am I bringing you this story? From my vantage point, depending on what part of the country you're in and uh, who you talk to, uh, for the first probably six months or so of the pandemic, wherever you were at, it was like 9-11 every day. That's what it felt like. That's what our healthcare professionals uh, were going through, okay? This is a slide I put up. I want to thank my good colleague, Dr. Howard Straker, uh, superb uh, physician uh, assistant, uh, as well as just all around good guy uh, at GW. Um, Because when I say health professionals, I mean everybody. I want to be very clear about that. That's something Lee and I always emphasize. When we say health professional, we're talking about everybody in any interaction you have on this medical enterprise. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm talking administrative staff. I'm talking environmental staff. I'm talking all of us. because. Health is in and of itself a team-based activity. And I will make the argument that part of the secret sauce or another aspect of resilience that we don't, that really got chipped into was the team-based part of it. That's part, that's where I'm going to, I kind of already gave you the kind of take home point a little bit, but yes, resiliency is a skill that we can learn, but that skill can absolutely be modified if we are learning it together as a team with a realistic, optimistic approach, okay? And the team is everyone. Every single person is, if you're, if you're in a community, you're on the team. So, so again, look, healthcare workers have been pushed to the limit. Uh, they're experiencing a number of things, um, depression, anxiety. And I still remember uh, my colleague, great, great, Dr. Christina Prather. Dr. Christine Prafer. And she said, Lorenzo, you are missing something because I was focusing on things. And she's like, what am I missing? She looked me down, you're missing trauma. I'm like, you're right. Okay, I'm not giving enough focus on trauma. She said, no, 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 you're missing it. And then I started to talk to folks because yes, I did see patients with COVID as a psychiatrist. I was in the hospital, but I was not on the main COVID floors. People told me stories like when I first started, everyone died. Like they came to the floor, they died. Many of us had never been through anything like that for that stretch of time. Certainly we have had very difficult nights on call. We've had very difficult, but you never had that much and that feeling of, if you will, I would say helplessness as well as maybe a sense of hopelessness, certainly. As well as fear in terms of what could occur or happen to you and your own personal safety. Um, I firmly believe that as we come out of the, as we continue to transition out of the pandemic, you're in these stories we share, I talk with folks like, you know, yes, I lived in my RV for like three months. Never saw my family because I was scared what would happen if I came back. All right. So these, these type of stories and the trauma that others, the people that went through was very real. And this, all of this is kind of the, if you will, This is kind of the, the heat, the, 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 the environment that the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center came from, okay? Now, in the midst of this, take yourself back. This is now late, we're getting into kind of late um, 2020 rather. We're, we're in the pandemic, we're in late 2020 and our residents are getting really incredibly hammered. And um, our GME Dean, uh, Dean Harold Frazier said, Lorenzo, we have, to, we have to do something. We have to start looking at what's going on. So we did a survey of our residents, all right? And I wanna thank Dr. Tony Artino for really constructing this. And what you can see from this survey is really uh, pretty uh, simple because from 2019 to 2020 to November, December, 2020, um, basically positive well-being just plummeted. That's what this means, all right? I feel more engaged in my work. All right, look at what 2019, 2020, then boom, then boom. I have enough time to reflect, boom, all of that. So this is what our residents, our frontline folks were thinking. And then think matters could get worse. Because not only did you have a reduction in positive well-being, 
oops, you had a significant uh, increase in negative well-being. I feel worn out and weary after work, 76%. After work, I need more time than ever to relax, 60, 76, 67%. I often feel emotionally drained. This was the state of our workforce. We started with the residents, but pretty much everything, everybody was feeling this, okay? So it was in this mode, oh, and this was the other part. What was it that people actually mostly wanted, uh, at least in terms of residents? C's for after hours appointment with mental health providers, having a mechanism to block clinical time for professional appointments, online self-scheduling of appointments with mental health providers, and telehealth appointments with mental health providers. This is what the residents wanted in terms of the, the resources for their mental health concern. So at this point in time, this survey, this, it, this had been brought to um, uh, leadership and they asked me, um, Lorenzo, can you take a look at what we have in place in regards to uh, systematic mental health and how we treat immediate distress for residents. I was like, oh, that'll be really e easy because I had done a bit of this work in 2017. This will be very simple because nothing actually has changed. We don't have anything. So there, that, that was a really easy answer. Dr. Frame and I like to keep things simple. That, that was easy, one of the easiest reports I ever gave. So Dean Bass, which blew my mind, she said, all right, we want you to uh, serve as medical director and to start up at that point in time, we were the GW um, health and wellness. All right, get that proposal up and running and started. And I said, well, you know what? Uh, practicing what I preach in terms of realist, realistic optimism. I was like, sure, absolutely. Sounds like a good idea. All right, so, whoa. And I, I believe I saw my colleague, uh, John Pan in the audience. Um, and John will tell you, I certainly am, I can jump into things with, uh, uh, again, with John, a very naive, optimistic approach or whatnot. Uh, John was one of the first people I ever spoke to in regards to uh, establishing or uh, working in cancer survivorship here at GW. And he was just an instrumental uh, colleague and just a really good guy. So I thank you, John. But Dean Bass set this up and she had an idea and a vision that this is important. And you won't have a lot of leaders that actually put all, they go all in and say this. And Dean Bass did. So before we even talk about realistic optimism, I thought it was important that you actually have a sense of where this all came from, all right? And so now you do, okay? So, okay, so early 2020, optimism had an all-time low, probably more like mid to late 2020, okay? So we're, we're in here, in the disillusionment phase, and that's where we start now. First off, you have to, I adapted this from the AMA, Creating a Resilient Organization. Um, we have to first start with what are the four main sources, which I like this, this slide here. What are the four main sources of, if you will, uh, occupational injury for, um, or stress injury for healthcare workers? Life threat, life threat, grief, moral injury, and fatigue injury, okay? All of these are vitally important in terms of understanding where people were at and what they were going through. When I first started working, it was actually just myself. It was actually just myself for a number of months until Dr. Frame came on board. Lee, when did you come on board? What was the exact date? I believe it was about a year ago, actually. It, it, it was, was April of last year. Was, I wanna say it was April of last year. Praise the Lord. All right, so, so before that, most of what I was doing was focused just on if you will, triage and distress management and working with people that needed immediate care. And I was essentially a band of one. But in order to do that, we had to be able to get into conversations about what people were dealing with. And I can't emphasize enough, there's a great deal of moral injury. Yes, there was fatigue, there was grief, there was life. But there's a great deal of moral injury. People felt as though, I'm not able to do enough for my patients. Um, I'm not able to be there in the way that I want. And what happened? It actually goes back to what one of our speakers just said. That ability to not only receive compassion, but give compassion started to evaporate and it got into a dangerous cycle. So because you felt as though you, it was already said, because you felt as though you were burnt out, you couldn't, you still couldn't do it or you shouldn't reach out or you shouldn't for yourself or you shouldn't like actually express compassion. And that just actually made it worse. All right. But this was the state of GW. Okay. And I mean, it still is, but at least we, we have some tools in place. Now, when I started working with everybody in terms of the first thing in regards to trying to cultivate realistic optimism is one, not only do you have to actually acknowledge 
your stressors and the stress injuries. That was the importance of the other slide. Until you put that up, a lot of times healthcare professionals, they, will, they can talk in broad terms, but they won't actually say that this hurt me or this impacted me. So you have to acknowledge that these things are real and that they can absolutely affect you. The other thing is that you have to start to have an idea of what it means to deal with stress, what it means to be with stress and kind of where you're at on the stress curve. This is one of the slides that, you know, at times we will use in the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center in terms of that human function curve in regards to stress. So also the component of good stress and distress. Unfortunately, too many folks in the midst of 2020, as well as still now, but in general, they were all there in, in that panic and fatigue and ill state, too much distress. All right. One of the things I like to point out, especially to my, my students, is well, there's there's distress, but we also, we don't want you to get bored out and we don't want you to get burnt out. So you can also have too little, which is boredom, but really we want you to be in that stretch zone. And occasionally you might have to strain, but once you get past that, that is an issue. So when you're working in your community or your clinic, or you're thinking about it, one of the things you want to start to do is to try to develop a language. And I find it very useful to keep that language simple. And stress, when I talk about stress, that is a term that is user-friendly. Um, everyone wants to talk about stress, all right? Um, not everyone wants to talk about suicide, even though more people want to talk about suicide than you think. But I find that stress, whole health and well-being can be very powerful entry points to a conversation about what it is that you're going through with the vast majority of people. Um, so this is a, a slide that I, I really like to utilize with folks. Okay, next, again, adapt it from the AMA. This is very useful in terms of what? Starting to develop that shared language around what it is that you're going through. Okay, the crisis, the stressors, then the stress injury, then no intervention. What happens? Burnout, depression, substance use, uh, increase in suicide, PTSD. But then what happens with the intervention? This little chart right here, very, 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 very um, powerful in my humble opinion in terms of framing the dialogue and the conversation that you can have with others in regards to the, starting the conversation about their self-care. I want to say that Dr. Rip and some of the other chief wellness officers across the country um, developed this. And he was, Dr. Rip, a really great guy from Mount Sinai who was so gracious in sitting down and uh, talking uh, with me because there's been people that have been in this wellness space far, far, far longer than I have. And I certainly want to acknowledge uh, everything that they've done, their support, and all the work that they've put out there. Next. Now, we are into the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center proper, okay? As we're going through this, as we're looking at the intervent, as we're looking at what our colleagues and health professionals are going through, this is when the, and Lee came on board and we were sitting there, we're like, okay, we have to get very clear about what it is that we're trying to do. What is it? What's our mission? How do we go about it? And this is where you have it, all right? So the GW Resiliency and Wellbeing Center supports individual departmental and institutional level purpose which is the foundation of whole person health to support the meaningful contribution of all employees and trainees at GW. All right, so we treat at different, at different levels, at the individual with, if you will, educational talks, uh, groups, as well as one-on-one -on -one coaching, organizational workshops, consultations, as well as institutional, all right, where we serve as a clearinghouse for resources, funding, and support. All right, I was very, 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 particularly after meeting Lee, um, just adamant that the foundational basis of the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center had to be in whole person health. It, that had to be the foundation of it in how we grew, all right? Not just one particular practice or anything of that nature, but that had to be the foundation of it. That had to be the foundation of Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. We may not get, we certainly weren't going to build it overnight, but people had to know that's where we were starting from. That was going to be our our scientific, our philosophical, this was gonna be our underpinning, all right? So that I think whenever you're trying to start something or change a culture or build realistic optimism, you don't have to use whole person health, but I actually think that you should um, because of just that idea of purpose. That's my opinion, all right? Um, but I do believe that as you're doing this across your community, your clinic or your health enterprise, you have to make sure that your model makes sense. And I like, I like a model with teeth. I like a model that can get dirty as well as clean. So I, I, I think whole person health does that. Now, 
So this is a current, this is our, this is a current organization and actually it's expanded quite a, a little bit, but this is an example of our current organization here. So we have a core staff, um, this made up of myself, Dr. Frame, um, our super duper, the next person to come along, uh, our administrative director, Janet Rodriguez, uh, uh, just uh, and, and phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal. The only person who can do multimedia and talk about Star Wars with me and everything. Yeah, it's, you're not going to meet anybody like that. I mean, who, who does that? Nobody, no people don't do that. No, 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 no. So anyway, so that so that was great. And then we added our superb, the next person to come along um, is our superb behavioral health director, uh, Ms. Victoria Karakcheva, who has done a phenomenal job in regards to really adding the, um, if you will, the rigor that comes with like stuff that you would need to like certify a center, uh, She's a therapist. She can she can manage crisis. She can build programs. She can do all of that. And and Victoria, I want to um, also acknowledge. I've always just been so humbled about how gracious you are with your time and just who you are. Considering that you know you and your family are from Ukraine and you've been doing all of this working nonstop in the midst of all of this. So absolutely. And then um, certainly uh, last and most certainly not least, uh, and I'd say to complete our, our core team was our, is our superb uh, physician assistant, Ms. Ashley uh, Drapeau. Um, and she actually has brought a, a great deal of energy as well as a needed clinical aspect as well. One of the things when Lee and I were uh, interviewing, it's like, oh yeah, she's what, 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 all of this like, um, uh, like movement-based work, all of this. What? Oh, no, no, no. She's with us. Yeah. We're, we're recruiting her right now. So that, that is, again, hopefully the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center, our team will show you, illustrate what we believe in. All right. That yes, purpose and resilience is a team-based effort. Okay. So that's the core staff. All right. And we have an advisory board, um, as well as many collabor folks that we collaborate with. And I'll get to that in a moment. So these are our areas of focus. We're, I'm simplifying this. Prevention and maintenance is based off of, again, whole person care and treatment and support, stress management. I could also say mental health, all right, in terms of therapy, things of that nature, but we do a lot of different things. And these are the services and programs that we offer, okay? Um, I mentioned our from our educations, our lectures, our workshops, our resource navigation, but then I also, if you will, um, a, couple, a couple of programs, uh, the Caring for the Caregiver programs, which is our peer support program, all right, uh, in which we train peers in terms of a, a it, Griff hesitates to call it a psychotherapy, but if it's a, it's, I would say it's a psychotherapy developed by Dr. James Griffith called Hope Modules uh, um, that we utilize different aspects of it. It's small, it's portable, and it generates hope and movement. Uh, we also have implemented Talkspace, which is an asynchronous based uh, text message uh, therapy platform, but you also have live video messaging. And we also have cl a clinician well being program for residents, at, well, basically for anybody really at this point in time, but certainly at that point in time at the initial implementation for residents as well as attendings, all right, um, as well as an employee assistance program. So these were our, our, our areas of focus. So again, need, all right, or disaster crisis, establish what the needs are, what were new and what were old. Think about what the mission should be. Team built around that, all right? Now you're starting to get into a position to where you can begin the work of cultivating realistic optimism. So we borrowed this from colleagues, um, uh, I wanna say Locke at University of Oregon. Uh, and this isn't, this isn't our slide, okay? But it illustrates what I think many, if you will, wellness programs, the collaboration that they have with different entities. So I wanna give uh, Dr. Locke a lot of credit for sharing, being so gracious and sharing that information with us. But you need to know that part, again, um, uh, resilience is a team-based effort and we have a number of partners that the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center works with in order to accomplish this. Okay, now, our center, even though I have it at the top, in certain ways, we had to start from a place of how do we work with people in high levels of distress, okay? How do we work with those that are experiencing significant mental health distress secondary to everything and the, the challenges of the pandemic and the crisis, all right? Then we built everything else. But again, if you're going to meet that quadruple aim, if you will, of healthcare, you're, you're, and if you're going to found, be able to 
get the foundation of cultivating realistic optimism. You're going to have to have a number of these things in place so that people are going to start to have the space to start to think about it. Now, again, this is just how uh, we go about let me just move my thing here. Uh, how you can request a consult. Uh, very simple. Uh, we have it on our website. Okay. And then this is just our consultation process, all right, which many, 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 many services at this point in time have used, whether it is surgery clinics, whether it's the Department of Internal Medicine, ob emergency medicine, dermatology, law school, at this point in time, the government, uh, Fannie Mae, um, I'm leaving a lot of places out, but a lot of people, we now have done so many of these workshops and lectures, um, as well as interventions, but this is our consultation process and how you go about it. And again, this is kind of just selling a bit of what it is we're trying to do. Okay, prevention and self-care so that we can just deal with the challenge and crisis and modulate the stress. Resiliency and well-being skills so that you can deal with the stress as well as the injury, as well as if, if you will, a formal mental health syndrome can uh, result. And if someone does get injured or if they have a formal health syndrome, we have support and treatment, ideally with the idea of preventing um, impairment. Now, this is just my gestalt in terms of concerns. 2020 to 2021, I thought there was a lot of anxiety, stress of social isolation, stress of increased family interactions, actually, uh, work environments and various forms of occupational injury. That was 2020, 2021. So where exactly are we now in 2022? I believe from the conversations that I have with others, all right, from the consults that we, we get, both formal and informal, all right, that, these are starting to become the, uh, the questions. Approaches to team dynamics, trust, transparency, new workflows. My colleague is in distress and how can I help? Referrals for a child and adolescent psychiatry or mental health. Um, if, if they would allow us to set up our own child and, and adolescent mental health on-site services, I, I don't think we'd have a human resource problem whatsoever. Uh, Okay, appreciating and understanding different perspectives on mask mandates. This is actually quite a, a testy thing, quite a testy thing, particularly around graduation and hooding ceremonies. And this is the big one, career and life questions. Where do I go from here? What just happened? This is gonna happen again. Am I the same person after this? What does that all mean? These are the questions that we're getting at in 2022. So, Again, I feel we are now maybe here, maybe, I don't know, I'm very, I mean, I think that, you know, there could be a variant at any other, another variant at any moment, but at this point in time, this is part of the realistic optimistic approach, I'm expecting variants. I believe that we're kind of at the point of we're going to have a little bit of reconstruction now, just now, and that reconstruction is going to have big roller coaster dips, much more than they're in this slide, but this is where we're at. I believe that we are still processing everything that occurred. I absolutely, I don't believe I know that, but I believe that we're at this point right now, okay? So reconstruction, but it's opportunity for growth framed by realistic approach. That's the key thing, opportunity, which involves choice. So opportunity for growth framed by a realistic approach. One of the reasons why I've been putting, I've been going all in about realistic optimism, um, because I, I've looked at similar to others, like, you know, resilience and what are the big 10, what are factors involved with resilience? Now, this was actually, uh, I took this from Charney uh, in uh, his, 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 his book, uh, Charney at Mount Sinai. Um, um, and it's, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'll give you all the title, I'm blanking on the title, but it came from Charney's book in terms of like, um, if you will, mastering their life's biggest challenges or resilience. And what they did, they based their, uh, they did research, all right, uh, on, on resilience. They interviewed people. They looked at the evidence base. And then one of my favorite things is they came up with the top 10, if you will, resilience or coping factors, all right? And me being a simple guy, I really like this. I'm like, all right, give me a list any day of the week. And I'm very, very happy, all right? So 
I love all of this, but I did love the maintained and optimistic but realistic outlook. And that's kind of, again, what I'm going to focus on a bit more as we move forward. I felt as though this was the thing that got, in particular, sapped from all of us, not just health professionals. All right. Um, it got sucked out. And part of that was due to COVID fragments. Sometimes that resilience or that realistic optimistic approach is best done when you get the synergy off of each other, when you play off of each other. A lot of that realistic optimistic approach can be not someone giving you a pep talk. It can be a shared joke. It can be just a smile. Like, for instance, if I say something right now, you all won't get it. But if I say Mac product and cheese grits, like my team will understand what I'm talking about. It's like a Seinfeld episode. Like there's a there's a language, you know, but a lot of that like realistic optimism comes from just your shared interaction with your colleagues and you being able to say, wait a minute, hold it. There's going to be a way out of this. Things have changed, but certain things haven't changed. So. That is why the focus on realistic optimism. And also from what I've seen, people actually that resonates with people in regards to, you know what? I wanna be optimistic, but I wanna be realistic. All this gets at what growth. All right, that's the thing. When I think of resilience, uh, our colleagues already gave us a definition of it. For me, resilience isn't just getting hit. It's not just getting hit and beat up and building your armor back. That's, I mean, that's not a, sometimes that's necessary, but that's not a very pleasant thing. All right, it's growth. It's growth. When everything happens, when things get burnt down, how do I come back, but how do I grow and learn and be better, if you will, quote unquote, that's a bit of a loaded word. But I would say the term I use, I don't use better, I use, because people say, sometimes people say, you go through something and you get stronger. I, I think stronger can be a loaded term. I prefer you go through something and you discover something different about yourself in addition to the other things, all right? So when I think of resilience, I think of growth. I think of how do we grow through this, okay? And realistic optimism is a tool for it. So this is taken from um, Shanfeld and uh, folks at Mayo, which I encourage everybody to uh, read their book. Um, it's, it's really great and it gives the blueprint in regards to Esprit de Corps and how you can build a resilient organization. I put this here because the driving dimensions of burnout and I'm not going to give you all another burnout lecture, of burnout or the same drivers that drive engagement, okay? But notice what's at the middle, meaning in work, purpose. What's at the middle of whole person care? Meaning in, in purpose. That to me seems like a match made in heaven. So if we can use realistic optimism to help you see, slow down and redefine or reconnect with your purpose, then my thought process is that all these other things are going to circle around it naturally and start to make sense, particularly if you have invested leaders, okay? But make no mistake that the driver dimensions of burnout are the same ones uh, that drive engagement. And here's one of my favorite snippets from the book, which I, I repeat a lot. Um, for burnout, when you look at the studies, if you spend if you have someone spend 20% of their time doing what they find they love, which I think is a very strong statement, I prefer find purpose in or meaning, 20% of their time in work week, you have a 50% maximum reduction in burnout. Here's the interesting thing. If you go over that 20%, the, burn, the reduction doesn't increase linearly. In other words, it becomes diminishing returns. So that gives us what? Something to plan for. That gives us something to do. That gives us something, whether it's you, your leaders, or anyone. Let me at least start with the idea. I'm going to make sure you spend one day out of the week doing what you love, that you find purpose in. Yeah, that's, I, I tell people, as a leader, I hold myself accountable to that. I tell people that I have to, I got to make sure 20% of the time you're doing what you love. And if I can't do that, then I suck. That's it. That's now, I can't promise you anything more than that, but I can, I can work on that, all right? So, and I believe that, that that's a key thing or metric because that's also, if you will, a direct illustration of realistic optimism. You can't do what you love 100% of the time. Heck, you can't do it 50% of the time. Uh, well, maybe you can, depending on what you do. Uh, but you certainly, 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 and I'm not, I'm not 
I'm not talking about, and, and I know I'm probably in this audience, there are a lot of people that are constantly doing what they love and I do too, but I'd be lying to you if I, if I told you I enjoy writing budgets and doing Excel reports. I actually don't, uh, but I see the point to it. So, but you can spend, you can make sure that people have 20% of their time dedicated to what it is that they love so that they can reconnect and rediscover purpose and find it. Okay, so now, when we talk about realistic optimism, if we talk about realistic optimism, we got to talk about two things. We got to talk about pessimism, and then we got to talk about blind optimism. Now, I don't know about the people in this audience. I'll take a pessimist over a blind optimist any day of the week. I, sorry, got to let y'all know that. I'll take a pessimist over a blind optimist any day of the week. A little bit about me. I'm from Northeast Cleveland, Ohio, raised by a single Black mother. Um, so there was no time really to be cute. Um, so I'd rather be a bit more on the pessimistic side than on the blindly optimistic side. You know, as a matter of fact, if you look at people that have survived very difficult things in life, um, it's usually the ones that tend to be on the pessimistic side. So I personally think blind optimism has zero place in a in truly in a crisis. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Notice I said blind optimism. I didn't say hope. I said blind optimism. Okay. Now, so what we're looking for is realistic optimism. Optimism with teeth, optimism that can get dirty, optimism that can go out of the rain, in the sun for that matter, in the desert, right? Optimism that is grounded in purpose and goals, but actually acknowledges the realities of the situation. This is what we're looking for. That's the sweet spot. So what exactly, what's the difference between realistic versus blind optimism? Okay, you notice the negative, but you don't stay engaged in it. Here, we'll do a little imagery. I mean, have any of you, um, one, a, a certain opportunity uh, of the pandemic was, uh, at least for me, for a lot of people, no traffic. Dude, I, I got into the hospital, like there was nobody's business. I was like, ooh, and, he, and better than that, a lot of times I didn't have to get into the hospital, all right? I mean, I'm actually at home right now looking into my beautiful backyard and my dog's flipping whisper there. You can't see them, but I can. So that's great. So, but when I did have to take the uh, traffic, you know, go in, have you ever been stuck in traffic and you're just sitting there and you're just getting upset? You're just getting mad. You're just getting more angry or frustrated or people are cutting you off or this, that, or the other? You have a couple of choices, okay? You can either choose to stay engaged in that traffic or you can figure out or be mindful or reflect or think about, all right, this is what it is. Is there a better use I can mentally make use of my time? Maybe there's a podcast I can listen to. You know, maybe I can just take a couple of moments because the car's not moving just to breathe. Maybe I can actually take a look to my right. I'm imagining I'm actually driving and look at the Potomac. Oh, well, wow. hmm. look at the Kennedy Center. Oh, well, I've been looking at it for 20 minutes, but that's cool. That's all right. I can be mindful of my environment. But what I'm doing is I'm not staying engaged in the negative because the negative, if you stay engaged in the negative, one of our speakers said something that I love. I loved it. When you stay engaged in the negative, in my humble opinion, that has a tendency to activate the fight or flight response, which has a tendency to activate excessive emotions, inflammation, and to drain energy. Okay, that kind of to me gets at the science behind it. But if you don't, realistic optimism is you make a choice, you do not stay engaged in the negative. Blind optimism, I mean, that's not even in, in engagement, that's like self-deception. You're not actually willing to acknowledge reality, all right? Okay, so, if you're blindly optimistic, you're going to underestimate the risk, okay? If you're overly pessimistic, you could, as an example, stay too engaged in the negative, all right, and what? Miss out on opportunities or what is going on. Either blind optimism, in my opinion, you won't necessarily bring the right energy to bear for the right situation. And pessimism can create such an energy drain on people, in my opinion, and people put in the, that fight or flight response that you do not even have the energy capable to really experience or deal with life when opportunities arise. So pessimism or blind optimism are problems. Realistic optimism is a key, but remember realistic optimism involves you not staying engaged in the negative. 
if you're going to build realistic, try to work with realistic optimism in your community, your clinic, or your enterprise, you have to have at least let people know there's some form of an infrastructure built up so that you can meet that some of those base Maslow hierarchy of needs, safety, security, and things of that nature. All right. So again, this is people have talked about that. This is if you to, to my right, it's the negative emotion cycle. You've got the negative expectations, the feelings of weakness. You can have self-pity self or denial or resentment. And that thing just spirals. I call that like negative death spiral almost. It just keeps going and going and going and going and going. All right. So general strategies that you can use for optimism in terms of if you want to start to break an optimistic approach down a little bit more to deal with this are a lot of things. There's positive reappraisal. There's goal-directed problem-focused coping, one of my favorites. It's particularly on attainable goals. But this is the one I want to pause on. And I thought the, the speakers today did a, a superb job of this. Infusion of meaning into ordinary events. So let me, as a story, I was, I was in the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. I've been honored and privileged to work with many health professionals. And a lot of times uh, people will come to me and they'll just say, you know, Lorenzo, I, I look, we were short-staffed for the past month. Uh, I got a poor performance. Um, this whole like optimism or everything that you're talking about, it's a load of, you know what? Can you like, seriously, I need a med and I need the med now. Okay, can you do that for me? I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, I'm, I'm, I'm pro meds, but I'm also pro nutrition, pro sleep, <laughs> poor pro movement, but let's take a moment. Okay, I get it. Right now you can't find meaning in work. Let's look at what you can find meaning in. And let's start there. They're like, huh? I'm like, yeah, what can you find meaning in? And it's gotta be small. It's gotta be small. They're like, huh, really? I'm like, yeah, let me start. Here, people will be shocked about this. Like, what do, what do I find meaning in? Oddly enough, it's a really simple thing. I find meaning sometimes in ironing my clothes. I find meaning in making up my bed. They're like, huh, why? That's a big deal. When I was growing up, I'm very, what was, the, what was the magic word? Appreciative, gratitude. I didn't have the ability to do all of these things. I didn't have all of this. So I find meaning in that. I find meaning. Then once I start small in those ordinary events, I'm like, I can, obviously I can pro pro uh, progress to family. I can progress to food. I can progress to sleep. But once I start small, once I start finding meaning in those events, I can what? Reactivate or rekindle my meaning and purpose and my chosen occupation to call, okay? But finding meaning, infusion of meaning into ordinary events. As a matter of fact, I've just been in my impression that if you get really good at it, everything becomes so meaningful that everything just naturally flows. You're like, you're just so grateful for everything. You can enter into, if you will, the uh, ever elusive for some flow state. All right, so now let us continue. All right, so. Some things or some tools I think are very useful for cultivating the spirit of realistic optimism. One of those is I talked about in terms of uh, the need to let go of the negative. When you think about it, I love radical acceptance because I love dialectical behavioral therapy. I, Marshall Linehan, all of it. Um, and obviously DBT has brought quite, acknowledges quite a bit in terms of Zen, meditation, mindfulness. But one of the things where I was first introduced to the concept of radical acceptance was dialectical behavioral therapy. And usually when I work with folks, I just give them this like radical acceptance in five essential steps. Obviously, they're depending on what you, what you look at, there's 10. And depending on how you work with folks, uh, you can spend anywhere from a month to three months on nothing but this in mindfulness skills if you're doing true DBT therapy. However, I find that many people just benefit from the idea, I need to accept what a thing is without judging it. I just need to accept it without judging. If you can do that, you can disengage from the negative and then you can allow realistic optimism to, to, to flourish, to begin. So radical acceptance is one thing. I also find that when people radically accept the thing, which takes a moment, you lower your distress and you can enter into um, a place of you stress. You radically accept, you observe. You remind, you acknowledge, you practice, list what it is that you're seeing. Again, no judgment. You're going to naturally find that you're going to move from that place of distress back to you stress if you do it enough, if you do it enough. So radical acceptance. 
as a key skill that we what we can teach individuals. Next, remember, if you go back to the slide, if you have a good memory, remember resiliency and well being center, three levels individual, department and group, and system. Now we're getting into groups. Probably the biggest concept that we get is trust. It's do people trust each other? And obviously, for many reasons, COVID just expose any kind of trust issues uh, or accountability that we had to each other and just put it out there. So one of the things that we talk about uh, when we work with teams is in regards to how do we start to actually think about trust and establishments? What are the elements that go into trust? All right, and it, you look here, these are, uh, these, are, uh, these are the interlocking gears of trust, the perceived trustworthiness, cooperative behavior and, and shared knowledge, but particularly the perceived trustworthiness. So we work with teams and we get, uh, I just got done doing a consult today. Uh, this, we're gonna actually have to do a workshop on in terms of how, again, how do we get team trust back? Okay, this is a slide that I typically share with folks um, in terms of, as you start to look at those factors that, help with trust, you also have to look at the things that what? Losing trust in team dynamic, insult to the person or group, sh shirking responsibility, public criticism, rule violations. Probably the biggest one is the insult to the person or the group, all right? I find you are more likely to engage in these activities if you have stayed engaged with the negative. You are more likely to stay engaged with a negative if you are judging, if you're not radically accepting the situation. And instead of radically accepting the situation or describing the facts of it or just accepting it, you are what? You are blaming, you are criticizing, you are comparing, you are contending, the so-called, if you will, emotional cancers. Uh, I don't know where Steve Covey got it from, but that's where I first heard it, okay? But again, these things, when you stay engaged in a negative, this can cause you to be more likely to engage in these behaviors, which cripple trust in teams, okay? Now, what I am telling you, if you're following also, whatever you do for the team or individually, you should also be able to do it in your personal life. So everything that I'm telling you should apply to your family. The same things in regards to team and trust at work, there are principles. I mean, you don't wanna do an Excel report with your family, um, but these elements of trust also apply to your family group, okay? So again, now we're, at the, now we're at a group or a team level. And then the next thing we teach is active listening. All right, you can spend all day long listening. You can spend, that's, I mean, people, I, people always talk to me about, you know, in psychiatry, they're like, you know, it's the talking. I'm like, no, 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 dude, it's the listening. It has, I mean, you know, I mean, the talking is great, but no, I don't, I, it's about the listening, it's the hearing, it's the telling of these stories. Um, it's the listening. And of all these things, I love every single one of them, including summarizing. Okay, including summarizing, that's probably my favorite thing, but probably the biggest thing, which lifts people's spirits, can make you feel good, but also helps establish bonds and connection is acknowledging. People want to be seen, they want to be heard. And a lot of times it's a very simple thing to do. Listen to what our speakers talk about. How long did it take to establish an empathic connection? I believe the quote was 30 seconds. That's like, so that means like, can you imagine like how, how impactful three minutes can be if it's really fought through. I mean, think about your favorite song. For whatever reason, I mean, Adele always comes to mind when I think about this, but I could pick other people. Um, but I, I, she's uh, for whatever reason, she's always my go-to. I still remember when I first heard her say, hello, or what? I'm like, whoa. I mean, that to me is an example of the power of music. But my point is, is you can have an impactful connection with people just simply by acknowledging them. And it doesn't have to be a big grand thing. Just acknowledge and let them know that they are there. That is huge. Or acknowledge that you are hearing them. So when we teach people active listening, we can teach them all of these things, but we ask them, I ask them to really think about acknowledging. And then the other thing is, I don't need everybody to do all four of these things. Like, you know, it's great if you can, but, but there's one of these that you naturally do. There's one of these that you authentically do, that you could do in a crisis you know, that you can do when you're having fun, but you naturally do it. I want to find what that is. And I just want you to do more of it and learn something else. And then I'll tell you what the name for it is. You'll be like, oh, there's a technique for that. I'm like, yeah, but you just naturally do it. That's just you. That's just you. That's part of your, if you will, using a little bit of stuff from Gardner, that's part of your talent. That could be one of your talents, but find out what you naturally do, then do it. Don't try to necessarily do all of this. So now, 
We've established trust. We've listened. We've radically accepted. Okay. If you want the a longer version of this, blind optimism. This is a blog I wrote. It only works in fantasy football. All right. Because I lost my residence in fantasy football. But in any event, you can read that. And that tells a little bit more. There it is. Resilience, the science of mastering life's great challenges. Southwick and uh, Charming. But that was just something I wrote about it that a lot of people actually, I put it here just because a lot of, I was like, I actually thought it was kind of okay. I'm not a great writer. And I thought it was like, not one of my, I'm not a great writer. And that certainly was not one of my great pieces, but it resonated with people. So um, if you want to check it out, you can. But people that I've been talking to, this realistic, this approach about realistic optimism is helpful. And now, individual, we gave you the techniques, we gave you one radical acceptance. You could combine that with anything that the speakers already said, mindful movement, belly breathing, anything of that nature. We gave you what I believe two key components in regards to if you're acting at a group level, trust and listen. But I got a little bit specific with you in regards to, I just didn't tell you to do it. I kind of tried to break it down a little bit more nuanced in terms of how you do it. If you wanted to actually speak with us more, we would we get a lot more technical as you need us to be. But for the purpose of this, I wanted to give you that. And then all of that, now we're at the system level. All right, realistic optimism and creating a culture. This is the whole person wheel. Dr. Frame showed me this and I love it. I just love it. I just, I, I look at it and I just, and it just speaks to me because it has purpose in the middle of it. Now there's different ways to go about this. I think that if you have purpose and you really adhere to it, you're going to start to naturally, with a bit of encouragement, reinforcement, that team, you're going to start to do a lot of those things that are self-care. You're going to start to do that. Okay. I would also argue, okay, you don't, you can't find your purpose right now. That's hard. That's very difficult. I personally think you have to double down on your purpose every five years. That's just me. You can agree or disagree. I think you have to double down on your purpose every five years because you, re you revisit all the same developmental task. So you got you to gotta go back to it and you got to figure it out. Again, nothing in life is easy. So even if you can't find your purpose, if you have established self-care practices, you're going to create that what? You can almost think of it as, as a protective circle that's going to let the purpose come up. So either way you start it, I'm fine, just so long as you do it, okay? And again, this is start, it took us a while before we could start to introduce this concept. Actually, I probably say we really started to get more robust with it, probably maybe around November, December, okay? So that was once we started to get the team and now it is really kind of like, we want to start leading with this. And now this is starting to become a language that we use in workshops with students, with residents, with teams as well as getting them to commit to more than one session, all right? So purpose. And when you do this, when you start to build this, then you have to start to build the resources. So this is our website. Thank you so very much, Janet. Um, this is just an example. Like, you know, we have multimedia, we've got services, we've got support groups, we've got resources, we've got events. We have a number of things. And our website is part of our platform. And it hopefully illustrates what we talk about in terms of the different things that one can utilize. Uh, we, oops, sorry. We've got our, we have our resource page. All right. And if you look to this, to the right there, you got COVID-19, anxiety, burnout, EAP, self-care, stress management, and yes, suicide prevention. Absolutely. Yeah. And then forget about that. That was right there. And we have our, one of our signature initi initi initiatives. And I want to thank Dr. Rosemary Bowes for her generous gift in terms of women's well-being. And I'm so, so humbled and proud of the work that uh, Dr. Lisa Catapano, uh, Dr. Frame, as well as Ms. Uh, Karek Chava have done to bring this all together in the lectures and what it is doing in regards to uh, advancing this topic. And I think for me, this is in terms of our first phase of development in the Resilience and Wellbeing Center. It is definitely one of our signature efforts. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna leave you with this. We started out with the idea of the pandemic and what it had caused and what it brought us through. Uh, Dean Bass actually had already led us off and she said that, you know, the pandemic, um, really we can start to look at that as an, a, a lens of, of opportunity. It, we can look at this as a lens for opportunity and how the pandemic came, um, if you will, opportunity for us to grow the resiliency and well-being center. Uh, many of our, our speakers, and I'm gonna go back to Dr. Don and I apologize if I'm um, mispronouncing anybody's name here. Uh, Dr. Don gave us a beautiful, 
idea of what it means, to, what resilience is, a definition of it, and the core ideas in that language. And I'm, I apologize if I'm missing anybody, but I did also want to go to Dr. Gordon uh, and what he said in regards to trauma, all right, and understanding what we did go through, that it did have an impact, and it is all right for us to do things in variety, in, in evidence-based things to do it. So with all of that, that was the framework. And then we talk about, all right, this is what we need to do. These are the forms of occupational injury. All right. Uh, these are the supports that we set up first for us. This is my take. Before we start to talk about that realistic, optimistic approach, once we talk about that realistic, optimistic approach, we want to not engage in a negative. We want to use evidence-based, if you will, techniques um, that are going to help us on an individual departmental level as well as on a system level. And then finally, growth is always a realistic option. It involves choice, but it's always a realistic option. All right. Thanks, y'all. Went a bit longer than I thought, but there you have it. That was really the perfect uh, wrap up as I, I knew you would deliver a perfect wrap up because you're really great at listening to people and pulling out little tidbits. So thank you for that, Lorenzo. Um, and now we will move on to the panel session, which we have a few questions set aside, but if you have any questions that are coming up for you, please put them in the Q and A. Uh, and I'm going to start off with um, a question actually that that um, Pravina came up with. It she oops, where did her question go? I lost her question. Okay, I will come back to that one. Sorry about that. Um, question that I also pulled from the chat. So we're taught to strive for excellence, right? This is something that we all, I mean especially in healthcare, but and in the world that we live in today, it's all about excellence, right? We want a center of excellence. We want to do this with excellence and that's all well and good, but it often turns into perfection. So how do we, we, we work that, that with self-compassion? How do we include self-compassion in that? How can we shift our mindsets and ultimately shift our culture? Lorenzo, I'm going to start with you since you were just talking. All right. So how do we shift our mindset from uh, one of uh, perfection all right, to one of a growth-related mindset. Um, well, what I think it's a great question. Probably the, the biggest thing that I think of is that I actually think that the idea of being perfect actually in and of itself interferes with discovery, all right? Um, to, to be perfect at a thing or whatnot does not allow for those, if you will, pleasant mistakes or accidents that and let you to see different things, all right? The next thing that I do uh, when I think about uh, perfection um, is I try to get people out of this um, it's almost like, because part of perfectionism is like, it has to be like almost punitive in, in regards to like, if I don't do it this way, if I don't do it X, Y, Z, this is a reflection on who I am. And so part of the thing I think with perfection is like the outcome has to be X, Y, or Z. I emphasize for me, what is your process? And are you mindful of the process? And are you appreciative and grateful for that? The outcome will be what the outcome is be. That doesn't mean I'm not outcome driven, but I think that that to me starts to, amongst other ways, starts to, starts to get at it. But I, I'm curious what our other panelists have to say. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, you know, perfection is a, and perfectionism is a disease from which I suffer. <laughs> and, me too. Uh, and many of us, I think, do. What, what I find, have found very helpful over the years is laughing at myself. Mm. Um, not taking myself so bloody seriously. Oh. That's that's number one, and that's that's the most important, and that springs me out of that trap of rumination. If yeah. I can get to that place, the the other is I, I keep in mind the statement that Miles Davis once made to uh, somebody who was interviewing him, and said, "Miles, what?" The interviewer said, "Miles, what happens if you play a wrong note? What do you do?" He said, "Man." So there's no such thing as wrong notes or right notes. It's the next note that counts. Mm. And that fits in a little bit with what Lorenzo was saying. It's, what, it's, it's what's happening next. It's how you deal with it. It's how you accommodate it. And the final thing is to keep in mind that when the Zen monks create those gardens and that little slide you had, that last slide reminded me of it, they always make an imperfection. They never make it perfectly symmetrical because they're reminding us, ain't nothing perfect. This is life and life is the way it is with all its complexities and changes and imperfections. 
you know, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to, I'm sorry, my team, I'm sorry, Dr. Don. I just, Dr. Gordon, when I was thinking about that last pitch that you shared with us, what would have happened if you didn't get lost or you didn't know your way? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I'm just, I'm just sorry. That's true. That's true. Okay. Excellent point. Thank you. No, please do feel free to jump in, um, but I will turn over to Francoise. You know, lots of wisdom already. Um, the benefits of getting uh, older is to really put uh, things in perspective. And, and we know that uh, this uh, um, perfection certainly um, not only doesn't exist, but attached our self-worth to complete unrealistic goals is really uh, pretty self-destructive. And so, you know, I really try to encourage now people to think, is this working for you, right? That question, is this working for you? And, you know, is beating you up, beating yourself up really, really working? Um, and it's a hard look to realize, no, it's not. And, you know, how how do I still thrive and strive and maybe reach for the stars, but with a different approach, maybe more from a purpose approach, meaning approach, um, mindful approach. And uh, like you said, uh, Lorenzo, less, uh, less, less punitive. And something for us all to strive for. And I know it's something that I, I am working on as well, Jim. So <laughs> uh, something I will, will take all of your tips. And the laughing at yourself is something my husband always tells me to do. So I will have to tell him later this evening that you agree yeah. with him and that he's <laughs> right, which is also something that I'm working on saying more that he's right. So <laughs> he'll be very happy to hear all of that. Uh, next question, and I'm going to start with you, Francoise. Uh, how do you integrate positivity and saying no? Because they almost seem diametrically opposed, right? Yes and no. I think so. Um, first of all, let me <laughs> hope you break up there. No, it's extraordinarily difficult. Um, sorry, are you, are you hearing me now? Yes, you sound good now. Okay, all right, we'll go back. Um, all those tips are really, you know, simple, meaning that a five years old could do it. And at the same time, they're very difficult. Uh, so say no, it's very, very difficult. Um, and so I kind of laugh and say, you know, don't, at least don't that say yes. That's, you know, okay. that, that's just get, get you, buy you some time. And uh, so you can have the, the um, strength. Uh, to maybe stay true to yourself and say no. Positivity to me is this literally, you know, it's it's more than the glass half full. Is okay, you still have a glass. You don't have a glass, you have your hand. Uh, you, you have to have a hand. Okay, there is, you know, there is a faucet. I mean, just this really looking for what's right. But I think that what uh, we are referring to is how those every single tip that I talk about, a five years old, maybe a three years old kid could do it. And why and how is it so difficult for us now, you know, grown up to do it? Um, so, you know, again, more, more in room for introspection and self-awareness and um, why is it so difficult? And I'm not... I have an answer because it's it's all personal. It's all personal. Uh, but you know, if you think again, a five years old kid will have no problem to tell you no and be positive and to be mindful and to be grateful. I mean, all of this and to have a great sense of humor and to play. And uh, you know, for us, it seems like it's it has become more complicated. Thank you. Uh, Lorenzo, mm -hmm. or Jim, don't, you wanna go, go for it. Go, yeah. there's, a, there's an experiment that I've, I've done for years and talked to other people, is to um, look in a mirror and say no, mm -hmm. and say it soft, say it loud, go up and down, and then 
do that for a couple of minutes and then say yes into the mirror. So it's a, it's a question of exploring what does it mean to you? What does it feel like? And it's different for everybody. Some people it's very easy to say yes and difficult to say no, some it's vice versa. But it's, it's a question of playing with it and exploring it and not being frightened of either the yes or no. And if you're frightened, feel the fright and say, no, you know, go, into, go into that whole space. Because I think this is, we, we're in a culture where it's, it's not easy. You mentioned five-year-olds, Francois. It's easier in some ways for five-year-olds, although they get socialized very fast. They're, you know, children are often taught from infancy, you know, what they should do and what they should not do. What you can say yes to, what you can say no to, or even if you can say no to anything. So I think it's something that we have to explore, see where we are on this spectrum of what yes and no mean to us. And then, then we become freed, freed from the habits, the habitual, the learned ways of doing things, and we can respond more spontaneously. It's a very interesting exercise. And I, I, I recommend doing it for a couple of minutes at a time, a couple of minutes no's, a couple of minutes yeses, and then put on some music and just move your body and see what happens. Um, I, I think it's great, um, everything that's said. Let, let me put a little bit of my take on it. I think that, um, what, yes, saying no can certainly be challenging. I think if we look at what uh, Francois and uh, Jim said, um, I think part of actually starting to say no uh, starts with uh, the exercises that you do with yourself in terms of being mindful and aware of a couple of things. One, what are your own purpose, your values, and your goals? Second, realizing, I want to say Francois said this, but I'll say it, you have a right to say no, and you have a right to be compassionate towards yourself. If someone responds to you in kind of a negative way, that's okay. That's okay. And then, um, so I think I think about what are your own personal values and goals, but then I also think about what are the goals or the principles or the mission or the purpose that are the collaborative ones? Because that gives you, because a lot of times when we say no, it feels like we're hurting somebody. So you want to take that element or balance it a little bit. Yes, you are, but if you're saying no because you understand the greater purpose, particularly if it's collaborative, then that's something that you want to do. And then I love what Jim said, uh, because there's no mistake for this or, or no substitute. Practice it. Practice it. And then if you don't get it right, don't beat yourself up. And big shout out to uh, Irene here, another pearl, which I love. And I think this is very helpful. If you practice it, but if you give no with the explanation, I think that that that's, and, and you are cool with that, that's about all you can do, all right? You give no with the explanation, but I'm gonna add another thing to it. The way in which you practice giving the explanation is give an explanation with the yes also. That way you're constantly building those habits. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, so Jennifer had a question. She actually wanted to apologize. She had to leave, but she will be watching this on the recording and let you all know that there will be a recording available. So if you miss any of this, you can watch that. Um, her question really is about aging um, and how learning might change with aging. And um, she feels like she has to prioritize because she doesn't feel like she has the ability to age in the, or to learn the same way she did prior to now when she was younger. Um, and how do you suggest picking those battles? What, what, are the most important techniques for her to start with? Or um, do you have a different approach you'd suggest? Well, I had a, my teacher for many years was a self-described mad Indian. He was from Kashmir. He was the most total madman, brilliant healer and um, very funny. And when I talked a little bit about not remembering things at times, he said to me, don't worry, if it's really important, it will be there when you need it. <laughs> so I, I, and that's been very helpful to me is, you know, it's my, my memory, I, you know, and, and I actually can't tell if it's better or worse than when I was 20 years old. I've forgotten. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it, but it's true because at times we, we underestimate because there's so, mu there's so much out there, and I'll be really interested to hear what the rest of you think. There's so much out there in the culture that's saying these facilities are going, these faculties are going to deteriorate as you grow older. Um, I, I don't know how true it is. I know, you know there's some cognitive decline, 
but I'm not sure that, that we can't learn new things easily. I think, I think it's a question of what's really important to us, what's really important that we learn, and uh, what has meaning to us. I think there is a sense that we have as we get older that we need to focus a bit more on what's meaningful. We don't have so much time to just kind of waste or, or let go. So I, I think that what, that's what she's got to look at. What does she really want to learn? What does she care about? Um, don't do something just because somebody else thinks it's a good idea. If it's something that you feel passionate about and that's really important to you, you can, you can learn it. I.F. Stone, you probably don't know, was a wonderful political commentator when he was in his 80s, he wanted to learn ancient Greek. And, you know, anybody who's tried to learn a new language as an adult knows it's, it's, it's difficult. But he did it because he wanted to read Plato in the original. Went, okay, that was his, that was his thing. Um, so I think that's the most important thing. What do you want to learn? What's important to you? And then noticing if you're bringing in sort of preconceived notions about what you can and cannot learn as you grow old. I'll open it up to whoever feels so moved. You wanna go Francois or I can go. All right, so um, I, I think it's a great question. Uh, I'm just gonna echo what Jim said. I mean, um, with a couple of little things, I think that when you look at it, um, yes, forgetfulness does happen with all of us getting older. Um, if you, a good way to just kind of, in terms of, I, I'll probably talk about memory, but I would actually say in terms of just, the best way to think about memory in terms of like prevention or making it do what it needs to do, is actually really to just focus on your whole health because everything, the body and the system is completely integrated. So your exercise, your nutrition, all of these principles still work with your brain, even if you're not like, if you mm -hmm. will, if your hippocampus or what have you isn't where it needs to be, not where it needs to be, but if it has normal age related stuff. But I thought that Jim said probably maybe one of the most important things, um, which all of us have actually been saying it, routine, but then the other thing, develop a new skill that's important to you. And then don't, I would probably say, I, I see this a lot, um, don't beat yourself up over if you can't remember all this stuff because the important stuff that you will, and here's a flip side I might say, and I'm not talking about dementia or something of that nature. Maybe you lean into it. I don't know about others. I mean, y'all can see my gray now. There's some things I was actually happy I forgot. Wow, that was just a burden. I didn't need that. <laughs> all right, that's good. But all the important stuff that I keep recalling, that's there. So just want to call out real quickly before you go, Francoise, that uh, one of our faculty members, Mark Webster, just pointed out that maybe we're trading memory for wisdom. And I love that. Oh, and so we have awesome. to we have to call that out there. Oh, that's oh Lee, that's a oh, that's good. <laughs> Ooh, I'm gonna write that down right that's um, I was just going to mention that and you know, I don't have much uh, much to add. I think that um, what you know, a comment that uh, I heard is that our, our library is getting bigger because we put more memories and more experience in it. And so it takes a long, longer time to, uh, to find a book because we, we don't have you know, mm. a small bookshelf. We have a gigantic library. Um, so that, that talk a little bit about self-compassion again and, you know, we, um, Jim and Lorenzo, you talk about, you mentioned that as well. So, um, yeah, I agree oh, with, I love my, that. Uh, with my colleagues. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. It's like, if your computer is loaded with data, it takes longer to get things, but it's still working. Your brain's still working. There's just more in there. I love that. Okay. So uh, a little bit more technical science-y question here. I knew this was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, in terms of science of the autonomic nervous system, wondering if there are online groups that want to do heavy chemistry. So by autonomic nervous system, they were thinking neuroepithelial pathway or TH17. So we're talking immunology, uh, really hardcore stuff. Does anyone know of people working on that type of thing or... Yes, maybe not exactly the right group yeah, for this because you guys I, are not lab scientists. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's I'll be honest. Uh, wisdom is knowing when you don't know. That's that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. Um, 
But there are a lot of good comments going on in the chat. I, it, Misha put up something very uh, instructive in regards to memory decline. So I, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's go I, to that. It, yeah. And I, and I agree with Irene in terms of uh, that sense of never forget to be in awe of everything. I think that's a core component of, not I think I know it's a core component of some forms of existential psychotherapy. I want to say Breitbart might have, might have had that as part of one of an element of his, um, his, therapy for uh cancer patients when i was uh, doing that but yeah yeah so let me let me read um uh, Misha Kogan's comment, because this is definitely his wheelhouse. Yes. Uh, so he says the actual memory decline is not normal, which I, that makes yes. sense. I'm with you. It is the speed of processing and capacity to multitask that decline. So very similar to what you were saying, Francois, it's more, the, it's the processing speed and that ability to multitask. So you do have to slow down to learn. So you have to honor the change, but there's no memory loss. And, in, and that memory loss is actually not normal. So if you are seeing memory loss, then you need to go see your doctor like Misha Kogan and he will help you with that. But otherwise, you know, your bigger library and taking right. longer to process, that's completely normal. So thank yeah, you I for think, that. I think people confuse memory loss with forgetfulness or the library being a bit big and it taking longer to find the book. Good, good point. Okay, we have a question from Praveena. How do you deal with millennials when it comes to managing, motivating, and inspiring them as leaders? This group of young professionals are extremely smart, but lack the maturity. And I would just like to point out that I'm a millennial. <laughs> so we're not all like that. Um, though I've gone technically in the Oregon Trail mini generation where I don't really belong in Gen X or millennials, but most people would put me in the millennial group. But anyway, generalization, how do you work with people who are maybe a little bit younger? And, and beyond millennials, now we got Gen Z who are in the workhorse. I'm sorry, work with them meaning what? Uh, to get them to grow into leaders. How do you motivate them and, and, and manage them? Inspire them. That's the other word. Yeah, I'm happy to. I don't know, I don't know that it's, well, go ahead. I, go ahead. I'm sorry, sort sorry. of contemplating why. I, I think we all we all reflecting because I said, well, I, I know plenty of uh, 50, 60, 70 years old that are really hard to motivate it personally. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am. I'm careful about making a generalization and, uh, you know, I think that um, fine uh, dropping judgment is, you know, something that I'm uh, personally trying to do and it can only be done when I'm replenished and I feel uh, that I'm resilient myself. Um, dropping judgment, dropping expectation, and then, you know, trying to put myself in someone else's shoes and, and inviting uh, people of all circumstances and all age to, to talk about um, meaning and purpose, which can be a little overwhelming at times, right? Because people think, oh my God, okay, I need to create a GW uh, resilience center. Whoa. Uh, but it, it can be, well, I, something much uh, simpler than, than that, that is just as important, you know, how am I going to try to be kind today or not be not, ju not judgmental or, you know, whatever this, this decision I'm making that today my purpose and my intention is going to be. So I, 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 um, I would have to say the commonality is trying to put someone else, try to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and, and see the world from that angle, suspend judgment and, uh, and, and see if we can also discover their purpose because living a life without purpose is really sad. And so I think that, you know, we, if we can help anyone to find meaning and purpose, then we will certainly motivate them. But I would, I would go with that angle. Um, I, I agree with many of the things that were said, and you have to be very careful about generalizing because a lot of times, you know, there are, you know, differences between every generation. With that being said, um, 
I think a couple of things come to mind with uh, millennials or those, uh, you know, even, you know, different generations. Uh, first thing that I think about is uh, hierarchy and making sure that people in different groups that you work with, the hierarchy is, for lack of a better word, it is flat. There is definitely more expressiveness and feedback and expectation that people want to be heard and listened to, and they have a right to actually speak X, Y, or Z or whatnot. And depending on what generation you're from, that could be a little bit different, okay? The next thing I think is that you also wanna make sure that you are open to new ideas, particularly of doing things efficiently using technology, all right? Don't just do something just because it needs to be done or, or you, you did it this way. So I think being open to ideas and particularly when it comes to technology and efficiency. And then the other thing that I'll add, which isn't really so much a change because I, I, I like what Francois said, in my experience, the millennials are just as purposeful or passionate, even at times more so than the 50 or the 60 years old because they don't have any tolerance for politics or doing X, Y, or Z that doesn't actually make a difference that is impactful. Many of them can, you know what? I can start my own business or X, Y, or Z. I don't have to deal with this unless I what understand the purpose. So I kind of feel like I want to lean into that a bit. Uh, and that can be a challenge because I've had plenty of folks like, Lorenzo, why do I have to understand the politics? Well, because blah, blah, blah. Well, no, why do I have to? I'm like, I get it. So those are just my thoughts. I mean, again, but I, I echo, you don't want to, ultimately you want to go with everybody where they're at, but it's a common thing and it's a common, it's a common thing. And it's something we just, you know, we just want to embrace. So I think I, I understand the question. Absolutely. A common, a common <laughs> informal resiliency and well-being uh, center consult. People don't actually consult for it, but they do ask us on the elevator, or at least ask me a lot about that. What, what I would add to this is that as a, you know, as a doctor or as a person, if other people come to me and uh, first of all, there has to be some reason for them to want to change. If they don't want to change, I don't, I'm not here to motivate people who are not interested. I'm here to help people see if there is anything that they are interested in. So for example, just two brief stories. One is some years ago, um, a couple brought their teenage daughter to me. She had been, uh, she'd cut her, she'd been cutting her wrists. She'd had hallucinations. She was suicidal. She'd been in the hospital. She had been on half a dozen different kinds of medication. None of it had done any good. And the, um, she came to me and, and, and she said, nobody can help me. She said, this is the way I am and I don't want any help and I'm fine the way I am. You know, other people call me crazy. They call me suicidal. I don't care. It's my parents' problem. It's not mine. I said, fine. Is there anything that you would like any help with? And she said, yeah, these pimples on my face. So that's where we began. And the things that I prescribed for her complexion would not be strange to be prescribing for somebody who was depressed or anxious. We changed her diet. We got her into doing exercise, some meditation, but we were working on what she wanted and everything turned her out for her. She didn't need medication anymore. She stopped cutting her wrist. She got her act together. My son, my son's 19 now, he was not the slightest bit interested in certainly in meditation were in most of the things that I was doing until um, he started to get serious about playing ball, initially mm -hmm. basketball and then football. Mm -hmm. At that point, meditation became important so that he could relax at the foul line. And he, yeah. he, he became a 90% foul shooter. That's great. <laughs> because yeah. he was just, he was in it, and it, but it wasn't important to him until that point. And then he became very serious about it. So I think we have to look, what's the opening? What do other people care about as opposed to what perhaps what we think they should be caring about? That's wonderful. And I would add that uh, uh, the stages of change are the very first step in the integrative medicine approach because that's what you have to figure out is where is your patient so you mm -hmm. can meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. So love that, love that. Um, we are running out of time, but I wanted to give each one of you a chance to sort of give your last thoughts. Uh, Francoise, since you started us off, I will start with you. Last thoughts is, um, I'm going to make it personal, how wonderful it was 
to be together and I learned a lot from you and uh, we are learning how to make this very meaningful and um, special, even though we are doing this on Zoom. Um, but this was a gift to me, so I appreciate that. And I, uh, I hope that all uh, attendants enjoy our dialogue, but um, this was a gift to me and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. We appreciate you, Francoise. Jim. Final thoughts. Uh, just enjoying being here and realizing that it will be important to get together in person here in DC. That we need to have, uh, I appreciate your doing this very much. And I think it's important that for, for me, it'd be interesting to see what, what else can happen, what can unfold. And I think what, what I don't think I know what we've missed over these last couple of years is in-person connection. And I've, I've realized, you know, not, not that I knew it was important to me, but I realized <laughs> how important that can be and, and, that, and, and what can come out of it. So I'm looking forward to hearing, um, you know, hearing, seeing what can come out as we come together and uh, explore what we can do here, here in, this, in, this, in this particular town that we're in. Francois, you can come visit. Uh, or bring us there, but people need to come together and we need to come up with, uh, with, with ways of approaching uh, issues, problems, concerns where we can share different perspectives and come together. I think we, too many of us spend too much time in a, you know, the, the cliche is a silo, but it's not a bad word for it, too much time in, in silos and we don't spend enough time out in the open fields with each other. So I'll look forward to that. Perfect, thank you. Lorenzo, final thoughts. Um, I agree with everything that's been said, uh, a gift. And the fact that I really, 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 um, which I think speaks to um, the energy. And I wanna thank you, Lee, and, uh, and, and everyone, who put the, everyone who put this together. And also, I mean, I'm just, I, I agree with Jim. I, we really need to do this in person. And if you just look at the chat right now, I'm just like upset. Uh, I'm trying to be mindful and not upset, friends. Well, I'm trying to be appreciative. But I'm seeing all this great stuff from Misha and Irene and Ashley. And I'm like, you know, these could be some great. I mean, I want to maybe Jim could give me some advice on shooting the foul shot. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's good stuff. So, I mean, so I just echo what everybody else said. And I can't wait to see, hopefully, us do this again and, you know, and, and in person. And, and I don't think, you know, we even have to to wait. I, I agree, Misha, again, you're always so wise with your words. I agree. We have to be moving beyond just pandemic. And we, we, we want to embrace and live our lives with an, a curious, appreciative, and grateful spirit. Well, thank you so much. I, I am a very appreciative of all of you and very appreciative of this group. Uh, and I, I, I agree, we would we do need to get together in person. There's definitely something special about that. I'm going to see Francoise and Ney at the International Congress, which I'm looking forward to. Wow. Um, but maybe we will do something here in DC. Yeah. Um, we have a really wonderful event every Friday, which actually we suspended this week for this wonderful symposium. But every Friday at two o'clock, we have a mindfulness experience. And Jim has been on that several times. Lorenzo, you've been on it. We might have to get Francoise on it now. Yeah. Um, it's a really great community that we started to have that connection during the pandemic when we couldn't be in person. And we're continuing it now. And I think that um, it's a really great opportunity for us to have a little bit of social connection when maybe we're too busy or we aren't able to get out and be with people. Um, so I think also thinking outside the box as to what social connection needs to be is another important take home that it doesn't always have to be a grand gesture. It could be something small just to keep that, um, that, that connection going. For instance, you know, when you think of your best friend, just text your best friend and tell them yeah. you're thinking of them. Like something really simple like that can really help with connection. Um, it doesn't have to be, I'm flying out to Cleveland <laughs> to see Francoise. I could just text her and say, you know, I really loved your talk today. Thank you so much. Little things matter. Um, so with that, we will, we will sign off and I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend and it's very restorative and gets you all ready for Monday. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.